It is election night and there is just half an hour left to get your vote in. Thanks for joining us for the KHOU 11 election web show. I'm Ron Trevino. And I'm Reka Mutaraj. We will be with you for the next few hours because the KHOU 11 news team has you covered throughout the night from the polls to the candidate watch parties in Texas and across the country. First, let's take a live look now from Tompkins High School. This is in Fort Bend County. It's a polling place there where in just 30 minutes uh, left as the polls remain open until 7 o'clock tonight. All right, we've got a lot to talk about tonight, and we've got reporters all over the place. Let's uh, join Shern Min Chow. She's live at the Toyota Center tonight. Shern Min, what's it like out there right now? Well, Ron and Reka, it remains kind of quiet behind me. This is the side of the latest Election Day legal battle, the Tundra parking garage here at the Toyota Center. It is the only drive through voting location on Election Day. There's been a small but steady stream of cars throughout the afternoon. No lines backing up onto the street as folks head up the garage to go vote. Originally, there were going to be 10 drive through locations voting locations today, all that new this year because of COVID. But the county clerk decided last night to use only this site after a federal judge noted that the election code requires buildings, not tents to be used. And the clerk was worried that drive through ballots at tent locations could later be invalidated. So folks drove themselves or carpooled here. Uh, some got a free ride thanks to a volunteer group called RideShareToVote.com. There are also discount Uber and Lyft rides, free Metro rides to any of the 800 polling places. So those were good options for folks. Uh, and technically, all of that is still available, but of course we've only got, oh, maybe 20 minutes or so to the polls close, so that window may be shrinking quickly. Uh, we've been keeping an eye here. We've seen a couple more folks' vehicles sort of sneak in here, uh, trying to get in under the wire before the 7 o'clock shutdown time. Uh, but uh, we've got a few more cars. Again, though, remains fairly quiet out here at the Toyota Center. Reka, Ron? All right, thank you so much, Sherd Man. We have to remind everybody, you have to be in line by 7. If you're in line by 7 and you haven't voted yet, you will get to vote. Let's go to Adam Bennett. He's monitoring things at Election Central at NRG. Hey, Adam. Hey, well, we are here at NRG. This is, of course, Election Central. It's also one of the polling places today, both in person and it's a mail ballot drop-off site as well. So a lot of activity going on here. Now, we are still about 30 minutes away from the first results being released from Harris County. These are the early voting results plus mail-in ballots received up until today. So that makes up more than 1.4 million votes. That is a lot. That is most of the total. So when these are released, we will probably have a pretty good idea of where most of the races in Harris County stand. But today, at last check, there have also been nearly 200,000 people that have voted just on Election Day across the county. And this year, the county has more than 800 different polling sites. Voters can vote at any of them, so it will take some time to get those results in. The county clerk says, though, they will release those results as they get them in throughout the night. And he is confident that by tomorrow or early tomorrow even, we'll have a pretty good idea of where these races stand. He is confident, he said earlier, that this will not be an election week, but rather just an election night. But a reminder, if you still want to cast your vote, you're a registered voter, you have until 7 to get in line. As long as you are in line at 7, you do have the right to cast your vote. But it is going to be a busy night here at Election Central. There's a lot of election workers, a lot of media here, and a lot of votes to count with, again, already 1.4 million votes cast just in early voting alone. That actually beat 2016's turnout and another 200,000 and counting here today. We'll be here throughout the night, though, keeping tabs on that. For now, we'll send it back to you. Okay, we'll see you again in a few minutes. Thank you so much, Adam. You know, just a few minutes ago, we showed you a live shot from Tompkins High School in Fort Bend County, and that's where David Gonzalez is tonight. David, is there any sort of line there today? Hey, Rick, yeah, we've just seen a steady stream of people come come in and out of this polling location. But as you just heard, Adam, and as we've been repeating, there's only uh, about 20 minutes left to cast your ballot. So if you're in line, stay in line, but also make sure you're going to the right location. At least here in Fort Bend County, you can vote anywhere at any polling location if you're registered to vote in Fort Bend County. We did see a guy come out who looked pretty upset. He said that he planned to vote, but wasn't going to be able to cast his vote tonight. And that is because he's registered in Harris County and he came to a Fort Bend County location. And when I asked him if 
if he was going to try to make it to Harris County in time. He said that there was no point because he was five minutes from home. So that's not the attitude, of course, that election officials want to hear from people. So if you do plan on voting and are in line by seven o'clock, make sure that you do cast a ballot um, and your vote will still count. But make sure that you are in the right county uh, that you're registered to vote. But as far as here in Fort Bend County, it was the first county in the state to report a 70 percent voter turnout. And as of 3.30 this afternoon, more than 21,000 people had cast their ballots in this county. But you can bet that number is expected to grow because, as we've mentioned, we've seen a lot of people come and go from polling locations just like this one at Tom Tompkins High School. And so far, the 2020 voter turnout has surpassed the 2016 total by more than 100,000 votes. But officials say that the final tally can climb even higher if registered voters get out to the polls. But still, Around 130 plus thousand people are not voted in Fort Bend County. They are registered voters. And so if that is you, please go out and exercise your right. Fort Bend County officials are hoping a third of the registered voters who have yet to cast a ballot will do so today. And polling locations, like I mentioned, are open. They'll be open until 7 o'clock. If you are in line, your vote will count if you do cast your ballot. And if you're in Fort Bend County, there are 80 locations across the county where you can vote. And that includes the Smart Financial Center, which is acting as a mega center for voters here in the county. Back to you guys. All right. Thank you so much, David Gonzalez. Live in Fort Bend County for an election. Well, we've never seen one like this ever. And uh, we've got a, a really cool tool for the night, our election tracker. Marcelino Benito is working with that to show us what we're seeing in Texas, Marcelino. Well, Ron, I want to start first uh, taking a look at the national picture. This is the electoral map for 2020. We've already uh, called some races, four projections already made. This is the latest coming in right now. Vermont and Virginia, 16 electoral votes have gone to Joe Biden. Kentucky and West Virginia, 13 electoral votes have gone to President Trump. Again, very early in the night. A lot of polls have closed, though, along the East Coast. We're keeping a close eye on Florida, where the counting is already about 72% done. Joe Biden has a slim lead, but still more counting to go. Same thing with Georgia. Numbers are starting to come in, and we'll get to those throughout the night. You mentioned what we're going to be looking for in the state of Texas. With this exclusive election tracker tool, we'll be able to show you what's happening in real time, county by county in the state of Texas. Polls will close in a matter of minutes and we'll start getting results. A lot of those will be early votes early on. Now, how will we know what's happening in Texas? There's been a lot of talk in recent weeks about whether Texas will turn blue finally this year. Democrats think this is the time to get it done. How will we know? Well, we're going to compare using our exclusive tool here to 2016 results. We're going to go county by county and see how Hillary Clinton performed. You can see in places like Harris County, she performed fairly well. She won by about 13 percentage points, a difference of about 162,000 votes. If we use our special heat mapping feature here, you can see the colors on the map actually changed. Let me show you what this is showing you and what this will show you throughout the night. The brighter or more intense or red or blue is, that just shows you the candidate was able to build larger margins in the state. So for example, Joe Biden tonight is going to have to come to places like Harris County. You can see it's a lighter blue. He's going to have to build a bigger, more substantial lead than the 162,000 votes that Hillary Clinton built up a year ago. Same thing goes for Fort Bend County. He's going to want to build more than 17,000 vote difference between Donald Trump this time around. Places like Bear County, he'll want to do the same thing. And of course, we'll also be watching very closely throughout the night the Hispanic turnout here along the Rio Grande Valley. We know Kamala Harris was in town just a few days ago trying to rally and gin up that support. But what we'll really be watching tonight in the state of Texas and whether it will give us an indication as to what will happen will be suburban counties in the Dallas area. You can see using our heat mapping feature that they're lighter red. So they were already starting to trend away from Republicans. But if Joe Biden can somehow manage to pull out wins with this high historic level of turnout we're seeing, and somehow flip these counties. We're talking about Collin, Denton, and Tarrant counties all around Dallas. If he's able to flip those from red to blue, there's a good chance it could be a good indication bellwether counties that could tell us what's happening across the state of Texas. We know the president performs very strongly in rural parts of Texas. He's also performed well in the past in the suburbs. We're going to have to watch what trends develop tonight. But those three counties in the Dallas area could be our best clues once votes do start coming in. Back to you. Marcelino, thank you so much for that update. You know, we're also following several local congressional races, including the race for House District 2. Uh, incumbent Dan Crenshaw versus Democrat Seema LaGivardian. Jason Miles is at the Houstonian with more on this race. Jason. 
Hey there, Rekha. Yeah, Dan Crenshaw supporters are already arriving here at the Houstonian where he hopes to have a victory celebration tonight. His challenger, Seema Lajavardian, is holding a virtual event later in the evening as we watch the returns come in for District 2, a, a wobbly kind of oddly shaped district that includes everything from Kingwood down to neighborhoods within the uh, 610 loop. Take a look at some video we shot today. Uh, Seema, as she likes to call herself, was out and about up in the spring area at a polling location meeting with voters as they arrived. Her main message during the uh, final weeks and much of her campaign has been centered around health care. She's a breast cancer survivor herself, an attorney, also an immigrant, another issue important to her. Meantime, Dan Crenshaw, who's held this office for the last two years, he's a freshman congressman, hopes to hold on to his seat. He's a former Navy SEAL, as you probably know. He was out and about today as well. Getting the economy moving again has been his overriding message. Here's what both of them had to say. We're feeling great. Our voters are out, they're motivated, and they're voting in record numbers. Look, th this election is about some very basic things, the basic stuff that people care about. It's been an incredible day going from poll to poll to poll, seeing so many new registrants and new citizens today. So I think we all understand that this is the most important election that we're having. Our democracy is on the line. District 2 has uh, been served by both Republicans and Democrats in the history of that district. Ted Poe, a longtime congressman, served in the district before Dan Crenshaw was elected in 2018. If you can come back here live to me here outside the Houstonian Hotel, I've been inside the, uh, the event venue where Dan Crenshaw will be gathering with his supporters tonight, and they're handing out masks. Each mask is emblazoned with a Dan Crenshaw logo, logo his face, of course, with his uh, kind of a trademark eye patch as well. They have signs in there saying that the mask will be required during tonight's event. And uh, I noticed tables also spaced apart and there are some overflow rooms as well. Guys, we'll be keeping track of things here. For now, we'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Jason Miles. Such an important race there. We've got another important race to talk about. It's in uh, Fort Bend County. That's right. We're uh, heading back to Fort Bend County for that congressional race for District 22. Sheree Preston Cole Carney versus Fort Bend County Sheriff Troy Nels. Grace White following this race closely. Grace, this is a really interesting one. It is Rekha and Ron. The, the race, as you said, congressional race between Shree Preston Kulkarni and Sheriff Troy Nels is expected to be very close. And one of the key factors could be turnout. We're just getting some updated numbers here. We're out at Smart Financial Center where we've been for the last few hours talking to um, Fort Bend County Judge KP George. Judge, what can you tell us about the turnout and the updated numbers you've just received? Um, thank you once again. Thank you for all the good work you guys are doing out there. And our numbers are, like I said before, it is looking very good. As the latest, as of 645, we are few numbers shy of 30,000 uh, today's number. That actually put us over 368,000 votes in Fort Bend County, which is around 75.4% of the Fort Bend County residents are voted, which is unbelievable, incredible, and actually uh, that is a historic number. Yeah, and just to put that in perspective, Judge, last time we were talking a few hours ago, it was about 21,000, and so yeah. now this is 30,000, 30, so we've increased by almost nine, ten thousand 10,000 votes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we should know soon what the early voting numbers look like here in Fort Bend County. Are you expecting any delay in those numbers, or do you think that you'll no, see early, them between it, seven and eight? Yeah. Early voting numbers are going to be posted. The actual the result will be posted anywhere from 7.30 to 8 o'clock this evening. That's what I understand. That's what our election administrator, administrator told me. And so, and also we had around 67.9% of the Fort Bend County voted early. So that means it gives you a very clear indication of uh, who is winning, who is losing. Um, and But um, our goal was <clears throat> making sure everything possibly we can uh, do so that our citizens could get out and vote, exercise their right. And I think I'm very proud of our Fort Bend County residents' response to that. And like I said, uh, I cannot even believe we have um, 368,000 plus we haven't done yet. And so uh, people voted. And so why it is significant? So 2016, it was 267. So that means 101,000 more vote came in this election cycle. That is incredible.
And Judge, I know we have just a few minutes to go, but really no line here at Smart Financial. No. You've been around the county today. Have you seen lines anywhere? <laughs> It, it, one or two places, uh, maybe 15, 20 people, maybe 30 people, uh, not even 30 people, 20, 25 people. That's the most I have seen because early voting was, you know, they all came out and voted. And, and early voting, we only had 30 uh, locations. Today, we have 84 locations. So there is a polling location in your backyard somewhere in your neighborhood. And so even even now, I encourage people, if you haven't voted, go uh, to your neighborhood and vote because your vote is your voice. This is a historic election. And this election result is going to decide uh, which direction our country is going to be going and act like there is no tomorrow. Your life depends on it because it is. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie Thank George, uh, Fort Bend County judge out here. As he mentioned, an historic election and historic turnout Today in Fort Bend County, as the judge mentioned, we're expecting the first sign in that congressional race between Kulkarni and Nels to be those early voting numbers. Again, expected sometime between 7 and 8. No delay expected out here in Fort Bend County, but we're expecting to see those early vote numbers to be the first indication of how that competitive race might go. All right, thank you so much, Grace White, live in Sugarland, And you have six more minutes to get in line. Uh, back here in the Houston area, Lizzie Fletcher is looking to hold on to her congressional seat, but she's in a tight race with Republican Wesley Hunt. You've seen all their commercials running. Chris Costa is following this one. Hey, Chris. Hey, Ron, how are you? We're outside of the Kirby Ice House Memorial in the Memorial area. That's where Wesley Hunt is hoping to have his victory party tonight. Uh, his staff tells me they'll be limiting the number of people inside, but uh, it is an outside venue where he'll be making his remarks at some point later this evening. About the candidates, both of them from Houston, both went to St. John's School. Fletcher is uh, serving on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in Congress right now. She says that's one of her main issues, uh, reducing the risk of flooding. Also, she wants to protect pre-existing conditions and lower the cost of health care. Wesley Hunt, some very similar issues. Also, reduce the uh, risk of flooding uh, as well as protect uh, and, excuse me, improve the quality of health care. Uh, but he also wants to protect law enforcement across the state and support them. Uh, this morning, both of them, they were visiting polling locations across the district. It kind of goes uh, from the Galleria area up into the Cypress area. Um, Fletcher and her husband had started this morning at around 5.30 in the morning handing out literature. Hunt and his team were able to knock on 250,000 doors uh, by the end of the day. Uh, Hunt's party here, uh, again, in the memorial area. Fletcher's going to be speaking to her supporters uh, by Facebook Live and then addressing the media later tonight over Zoom. Now, Fletcher won Texas, Texas's 7th Congressional District in 2018. That disrupted about 50 years of Republican control of this district. And the first Republican to take it over back in 1967 was George H.W. Bush. So Republicans are really looking to get control of this uh, district again. Uh, Lizzie Fletcher hoping to hold on to that for the Democrats. All right, thank you so much, Chris Costa. We appreciate that update. You know, all night we will be bringing you the latest poll numbers, talking about the races in depth, but voting can be very, very personal. And this story, next story, is very personal for one of our Tegna journalists. Anastasia Bolton is an immigrant, and tonight she reflects on what it was like to become a citizen and vote in this country. And she's reminding us that no matter who you're voting for, we are so fortunate to call this country home. Voting is emotional. We do it because we're hopeful or angry. Maybe we feel it's our duty or we have faith in the process. Americans who had to fight to vote and those who still do see it as a right. For some of us, or maybe just me, who got to choose to make this country home, I still feel that it's a special part of being an American. My immigrant story started in Dallas in 1995. My first U.S. presidential election was in 08. I just became a citizen. It was emotional then. It still is now. After voting in my first presidential election in Texas, I moved back two years ago. The history and the present of my birth country makes me really appreciate what we have here. It's not pretty. It is not perfect. And lately, pick a word. A word that comes to mind for me is emotional. But we still participate. 
We still want to be heard. We're showing up in record numbers because it seems no matter how we feel right now, we have faith the process will work. Some wonderful perspective there on this election day. All right, back to Election Central at NRG. Adam Bennett has been there all afternoon. Adam, it's going to be a very long night for those poll workers. That's right, Rekha. Now, of course, we have just a couple minutes left until the polls close across Harris County. Again, anybody who is in line at that time will be able to vote. That includes people here at Energy Arena. It's one of the polling places. It's a mail drop off location, and it is also Election Central this year. Now. Clerk Chris Hollins told us earlier today he plans to follow the usual plan for releasing the unofficial election results that they've followed in years past. That means just after seven o'clock, once those polls officially close, they will release the early voting results and they'll release the mail in ballot return results uh, up until today. Now that totals over 1.4 million votes. A lot of people came out to vote early and by my math, that's well over 80% uh, could be almost 90% of the total votes cast in Harris County because as of the latest count that Harris County just released, just over 200,000 people cast their ballot in person on election day today. So that means that when they release these results shortly, probably within the next half hour, we should have a very good idea of where most of the races stand, at least in Harris County. So again, they will release those results around seven o'clock, probably a little bit after, as they have done in years past. And then as far as the 800 plus voting centers that have been used as polling places today, as they close, they will send their results down here and the clerk tells us they will process those and release those as they get them throughout the night. But he told me earlier, he is confident that that is something that he should be able to do over the next few hours. And as he told me earlier, he does not think this is going to be an election week scenario in Harris County as maybe the fear in some other places, but rather simply election night, despite the historic turnout that the state's most populated county has seen. We'll send it back to you. Adam Bennett and the clock has just struck seven o'clock, so it's too late to get in line if you want to vote. A lot of people go to a place on West Gray, the multi-service center there, and Matt Doherty is out there. It's a very place, a very popular place to vote, Matt. I voted there many times in the past. What's, what, what's it been like out there today? Okay, yeah, we're out here and it is, uh, it is seven o'clock on the dot right now and the polls have closed. Uh, you can see everybody on that side of the fence. These are the Biden supporters right across the street. Those are the Trump supporters. They've been out here uh, pretty consistently throughout the day today, uh, voicing their support for candidate Joe Biden and also for President Donald Trump on the other side. I do want to say that most of the uh, discourse today has been fairly civil. Uh, there were only just a couple of uh, episodes during today where things, you know, did get heated. And there was uh, there was a point in time when some of the law enforcement officers who were out here actually had to separate uh, a few people, but nothing escalated to the point where it was physical. So it'll be interesting to see how much longer uh, these groups will decide to stay out here. Uh, waving flags and, and cheering and cars driving past honking. The polls now have closed. If you turn this way, Ryan, you can uh, take a look over here where normally uh, most of the time you would see on uh, election day a line coming out of this polling site because this is a very uh, popular polling site in Harris County. However, tonight you do not. But if you were not in line by seven o'clock tonight, you will not be able to vote. So. Uh, you know, hopefully everyone who, who has wanted to vote has gotten a chance to vote and it doesn't appear that uh, there's going to be any waiting around uh, for people to get inside to cast their ballots tonight. Uh, with that, I'll send everything back to you guys. All right, Matt, good to hear that things stayed mostly peaceful there. So we appreciate that update and wonder how long those folks are going to stay out on the street now that the polls have closed at 7.02 p.m. We're going to go live now to Marcelino Benito, who has been watching the maps closely. Marcelino, what's the latest? 
Well, Ray, the polls just closed in many states along the East Coast and the central United States, and we have a new update for you on the electoral map. Joe Biden has 85 electoral votes. Trump is at 55. Lots of projections made in typical states. No real surprises here in what we expected early on in the night. I want to walk through you through some scenarios that we might look to tonight as we wait to see how states fall for both candidates. Let's go look back at 2016. This was the electoral map four years ago. It's the map that got Donald Trump to the White House. He did it by tearing down the blue wall that Democrats were hoping would get Hillary Clinton to the White House. Donald Trump won Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. So now four years later, Joe Biden wants to rebuild that blue wall. Let me show you what that would mean for him if he's able to do it. If he's able to win states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, those three states alone, just flipping those, keeping all the Clinton states, that's 46 electoral votes. That gets Joe Biden to 278, eight electoral votes above the 270 he needs to win the White House. Now, the Biden campaign feels pretty good about what's going to happen here in the upper Midwest, but they say they have plan B's, C's, D's if this doesn't go their way. Let's walk through some scenarios in that situation. Let's say Donald Trump had a great election night and he comes in and he wins Pennsylvania. He holds on to it. He won it four years ago. Well, Joe Biden believes he can come in to North Carolina where they're already counting votes and it's close. He thinks he can pull that off. If he's able to do that tonight, despite losing Pennsylvania, he still gets to 273 and wins his first term as president of the United States. Same goes for places like Georgia, He's able to flip Georgia despite losing Pennsylvania and another upper Midwestern state. Joe Biden can still get over the 270 threshold. Now, the president is not out of this by any means, but he has a tighter rope to walk as he tries to get those 270 electoral votes. Everything you see in white are leaning one way or another or just complete toss up states, according to polling going into tonight. So let's play some scenarios out for Donald Trump. He needs to come in here and have a great election night, a huge turnout he's counting on tonight. Let's say he wins Iowa. He wins Ohio. North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, which is incredibly close right now. We can get into that in a little bit. Let's say he holds on to Texas once we count votes here, and he holds on to Arizona, which he won four years ago. All that, he's perfect tonight, and he's still only at 258. So somehow, somewhere, President Trump is going to have to find some upper Midwestern magic like he got in 2016. He's going to have to try and win Pennsylvania again. He does that. He gets to 278. He wins a second term. If he can't do it in Pennsylvania, Michigan would be a good option for him. If he can't do it in Michigan, then it gets a little more complicated. He's going to have to try to win some Clinton states like Nevada, if he's able to do that, or perhaps win New Hampshire. The math, he can get there. But if you see my point, Joe Biden has a big menu of options at this point. Donald Trump has to walk a very tight rope to see what happens. Before I toss it back to you, I do want to check out to see if we have any Texas results yet. I know polls closed. It could be early and we do. We do have some votes. These are real time votes that have come in in Harris County. It's early. It's very early. 56.2% to 42.8% for the president. Right now, Biden has 789 votes in Harris County, 600 and 601 for Donald Trump. It's a difference of about 188. Again, very, very early, but we're already starting to see this map fill in. It'll continue to fill in as more votes come in throughout the night, and we'll keep track of it for you guys. Back to you. All right, thank you so much, Marcelino Benito. Uh, we're going to do a lot of talking tonight, but also tonight it's also going to be about numbers. So right now, let's show you the numbers that we do have, and uh, we'll let you we'll let you just kind of scroll through these, and we'll be, we'll be right back. But here are all the numbers that we have so far.
All right, just some of the races we have some numbers on, but of course it's just very early. The polls closed just 10 minutes ago, at least the lines, you couldn't get in line as of 10 minutes ago. Uh, we'll be giving you numbers all night long. Uh, one of the places that was quite popular today was the Toyota Center. It was the only place you could go to today if you wanted to do some drive through voting in Harris County. Sherman Chow has been monitoring that all day. What's it like out there tonight, Sherman? Well, you know what? I can tell you without a doubt it's after 7 o'clock. I don't need a clock. I don't need a watch. I don't need an iPhone. I just need to look over my shoulder at the Tundra parking garage at the Toyota Center, that drive through polling location, because you can see that gate is closed. And that came down promptly at 7 o'clock. That is the inbound lane for voters who want to go in to cast their drive through ballot. Uh, to the right, you will see the outbound lane remains open. So we presume there are a couple of cars left up there uh, where the drivers, where the passengers continue to cast their ballots. You know, it has been a steady, small but steady stream of cars throughout the day here. There have been no lines backing up onto the street as folks came here to go ahead and cast their ballots uh, from their vehicles. Originally, there were going to be 10 drive through locations today, all this new, of course, because of COVID issues. But the county clerk decided last night only to use this site after a federal judge noted that the election code required buildings, not tents, to be used. And the clerk was worried that drive through ballots at tent locations may later be invalidated. So today, folks drove themselves, carpooled, or some even got a free ride. I'm a volunteer with a group called Rideshare to Vote. We're giving people free rides to the polls. They will pick you up and take you home. And we just went to the Toyota station and I just voted. It was so easy. And that is what we heard from a lot of folks who came through this uh, station here, that it was very easy. Uh, you know, they presented a little ID, they got a tablet, they never had to get out of their vehicles to vote. And folks concerned about COVID uh, appreciated that. Uh, 800 polling places, all of which are shut down, including this one at the center of a huge court battle and media coverage. Lots of sturm and drang about that. But uh, actually on election day, the traffic here that we saw throughout the afternoon, relatively quiet back to y'all. All right, Chernman, thank you so much. You know, it wouldn't be election night here at KHOU without our political our analyst, political analyst political Bob Stein. And Bob, this election has broken so many records, especially when it comes to voter turnout. Are you surprised at all by this? Well, no, I mean, I think no, we I'm saw this so in, in 2018. Um, we saw a record turnout for a midterm election that we've not seen in 40 to 50 years. So we were, so to speak, queued up for it. If 218 turned out 53% of registered voters in a midterm election without a presidential race, we were expecting a, to see this in Harris County. My sense is the numbers will probably go high, 65, maybe 66, 67%. But of course, these have been extraordinary times. It's not just um, President Trump and his candidacy which has been constantly under pressure from the Democrats since his inauguration, but you add into that COVID-19 and a tremendous desire to vo of voters to show up. And I think here in Texas, um, although there's a lot of controversy about mail-in voting, drive-through voting, voters wade through it, all of these difficulties. And uh, here in Harris and throughout the state, we're seeing probably more than 12 million votes cast, which will put us, I think, at an historic uh, post-World War II record for turnout. You know, Bob, you, you, know, you Bob, mentioned uh, drive through voting, mail-in voting, um, obviously popular choices, specifically drive through voting and sort of the legalities surrounding that and folks wanting to stop it. Do you think that this is going to be something that sticks around for other elections as well? Because it seemed to be very popular with voters this year. Let me tell you, I, I did several surveys um, and I've actually looked carefully at the people that voted by drive through and about a third were Republicans, maybe as many as 38%. Obviously, we can't be certain who's a Republican without party registration, but here's what I think, and I think it, it's responsive to your question. All of the things that the county clerk here in Harris County did were enormously popular with voters, including Republican voters. Even Republican voters who chose overwhelmingly to vote on election day as opposed to by mail if they could or early, still like what the clerk did in terms of safety measures, in terms of the number, 
and diversity and information. Um, I think that the, uh, so to speak, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. There may be efforts to curtail this, but I think in the next legislative session, even if the Democrats just gain a few seats in the Texas House, you'll see a move to make these kinds of changes, drive through voting, extra early voting days, extra sites, and we hope, of course, the COVID virus is over and we don't have to worry about safety. But yeah, this is, this is your modern election. And I think there'll be a big move to expand uh, mail-in voting. You know, early voting was so popular this year. We had record numbers in several counties. And I wanted to talk about kind of who the early voters are. If I'm correct, when we've talked in the past, we've mentioned that it was more conservative voters. Is that still the case? Um, or is it is it hard to tell if it's conservative or, or, or Democratic voters who are coming out early and turning up at the polls early in early voting uh, as opposed to on election day? Yeah, historically, when Texas was one of the first states, if not the first state to have satellite in-person early voting, it was something that Republicans and older voters and conservatives and frankly, more frequent voters, um, they were aware of it. They found it convenient. It didn't increase their likelihood of voting, but they took advantage of it. Um, younger voters, black voters, Hispanic voters didn't often have these early voting locations central to their communities, um, and they were uncomfortable going out of their communities to vote and they, they stuck to election day. That's changed over the last 40 years. And you see a steady increase in early voting across the board. This is the first election and probably because of the president where early voting and particularly mail-in voting were particularly uh, popular because of fear of spreading and contracting the COVID virus. But still the president weighed in very heavily and many, many Republicans, 13 to 17, 17% is my estimate of Republicans who had traditionally voted by mail and they were mostly over 65 Astute. They went away from voting by mail and voted either in person early or on election day. Republicans clearly did not um, drive themselves to early voting. Um, the Democrats did. I don't think it's so much that the Republicans ceased to vote early or in person. It's just there are more Democrats in Harris County and more of them coming into the electorate. And uh, as a result, we see a much higher share of Democratic vote somewhere in the area of about 63, if you include mail-in voting, voted before election day. The almost opposite numbers, around 34, um, with what we are, may or may not see in Harris County and throughout the nation, I might add, Florida, Georgia, all have early voting as well as mail-in voting, but we see a real skew. Um, and clearly the Trump campaign is hoping to really make up the distance um, in North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia, and uh, I think probably in Pennsylvania by a heavy um, election day turnout. Um, in Harris County, it doesn't seem like it's worked. I counted about 300,000 or more Republicans who had voted in 2016 and 2018 who had not yet voted as of last Friday. And uh, the turnout rates today look like they may be at or just above 200,000 votes. Um, that's still a lot of Republican votes that were left on the table. Um, Canvas will tell us why, or Canvas will tell us how big that number is, but if Republicans don't have a good night in Harris County, and they generally don't. This is a blue county. But if we see that in other counties, Tarrant, Bear, and some of the real competitive counties like Collin and Williams and uh, Denton, then I think the Democrats might have a shot at doing much more um, damage to the what they call the red wall here in Texas, um, particularly for the president. You know, there have been you really have been big, really... huge, great efforts to get minority voters to the polls this election. How will that vo voter turnout uh, affect this election? Well, there's no question. Um, Democrats generally benefit from turnout. Um, their base um, is not only and has been a little smaller, it's closed the gap with new registrations, but they simply do not vote at the same rate. And some statistics here um, are worth bearing uh, and looking at. Voters between the ages of 20, 18 and 25 are probably the lowest turnout. Their share in the electorate is barely 6% of registered voters here in Harris County. They're polling at almost eight and 9%. So what you're seeing is a dramatic increase in new voters who came into the electorate actually in 218 when they first started voting. They're showing up again in this election. Of course, voters over 50 and over 45 are a high share, but when you get to the 65, 70, 75 bins of voters, um, there are simply fewer of them than there were in 2018 or 16. So you're, and I'll give you another number. Um, among African-American men um, over 45, there was almost a 78% increase in voter turnout. It's not a lot of number of voters, but what you're beginning to see, and I think it's happened throughout the state of Texas, 
is a demographic shift that favors the Democrats, and it's accounted for their success. Not if it happens tonight, it happened in a 218. It's happened in every federal election since 2010. Democratic share of vote has gone up, and that we see, of course, in winning House seats in the U.S. House and Texas House seats. All right, Bob Stein, we have so much more to talk about tonight, but uh, we're going to head out to some other stories. We will check in with you in a little bit. Thank you so much. Ron, I'll send it over to you. Thank you so much, Rekha. Let's go to uh, Election Central. Adam Bennett is there. Hey, Adam, can you hear us okay? Hey, Adam. Hey, Ron, good evening. Uh, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia just started speaking right now, and we're expecting to hear from County Clerk Chris Hollins in about 10 minutes. But I was just reading a tweet from Harris County Judge Alina Hidalgo. She says that Harris County has crossed 200,000 votes just on Election Day. She says the county has hit 65 percent turnout. That is the highest since 1992. She's also telling voters if they are in line right now, stay in line. As long as they were there by seven, they do have the right to vote. And she continued by thanking the voters and also the election workers for their participation. Now, right after seven, Harris County released the results from early voting. And that really is the lion's share of the votes, well over 80%, 1.4 million people cast their ballot early, even in person or sending in their mail ballot. From what that shows, again, early voting just in Harris County alone, it shows in the presidential race, Joe Biden with 56% of the vote, Donald Trump with just under 43. So about a 13 point advantage just in Harris County based on those early voting results for Joe Biden. And the senator's race, uh, MJ Hager, 53, just under 53% of the vote. John Cornyn, almost 45% of the vote. So Hager has the lead again in Harris County early voting. And there's many, many others that you can see at harrisvotes.com. Now, once all these voters that are in line at these 800 plus voting sites cast their ballot, then those poll workers will bring those results here to Central Count. And as they receive them on an ongoing basis, these poll workers behind me will be counting those votes as the night continues. The clerk says he's confident they will have results within the next few hours or so. He didn't want to give an exact timeline because some things are unpredictable, uh, but he is confident, as he said before, that it will not be an election week as far as waiting for results, but election night. He's confident that if they use the same system they have before, that they will get those results fairly quickly, especially because the vast majority of the votes in Harris County were cast early in person or through mail, well over 80 percent. And those results have been released and posted at harrisvotes.com. We'll send it back to you. All right, Adam Bennett, we'll probably check in with you in a few minutes when we hear uh, more people speaking, especially Chris Collins. In the meantime, uh, Matt Doherty live at the polling station on West Gray, that multi-service center there, a very popular place to vote. It's also where we saw a little earlier Biden supporters and Trump supporters on either side of the street um, have gathered. Matt, are they still there and are things still peaceful? No, it went from a very popular polling place to kind of a ghost town at this hour. All you can see are just uh, signs left out here for the most part now. Uh, pretty much all of the supporters from either side have uh, gone ahead and gone home for now to watch uh, these, these election results roll in. Uh, the uh, polling site actually closed officially just about 25 minutes ago. We haven't really seen anybody coming out of the polling site. You know, you had to be in line here by seven o'clock if you still wanted to cast a ballot and that time has long passed now. There was no line at this polling site, probably uh, indicative of the number of people who decided to go ahead and uh, vote early here in Harris County. Uh, didn't have any uh, trouble, any of the people trying to cast a ballot today with you know, issues standing in lines or anything like that. So many of the other elections that we've seen in the past, that just wasn't part of the deal tonight. It wasn't part of the deal today earlier. You know, we saw uh, some of those supporters earlier this afternoon uh, getting uh, very uh, excited. Uh, they were very excited. This is an election that's really polarized so many people in this country. And uh, at some points we did see people get uh, a little bit heated. We saw a couple of arguments uh, that got just a little bit out of control, I would say, nothing physical ever happened out here, but uh, there were times when some people had to be uh, separated by law enforcement officers. But for the most part here, 
uh, in, in Houston, in the Montrose area. This has been uh, a time that is, has shown the rest of the state that people can have different ideas and still respect each other's uh, opinions and, and respect each other just as a human being. And that's certainly uh, what we saw in Houston, Texas today. Break it. All right, uh, Matt, thank you so much. Ron? All right, well, let's go to Sylvia Garcia right now. We understand she's giving a speech. Let's listen in. Bueno, pues yo soy muy contenta. Ya vi durante el día que estábamos votando con mucha energía, con mucho ánimo, con mucha fuerza. Así que espero una victoria para todos los demócratas aquí en el condado y ojalá también en el estado. ¿Qué significa para la senadora para usted estar haciendo bien como dice que es tener algo? ¿Perdón? ¿Quería decir algo acerca de lo que le va a dar estatal? ¿Estatal? ¿Qué significa para usted? ¿Usted fue parte del movimiento ese de Me Too en 2018? Muchas mujeres, más de 100 mujeres. No, mira, hay... Bueno, pues, uh, the, in English, all the question was about the Me Too movement and the number of women running. Uh, bueno, pues, para mí es muy importante que, que, que vemos que hay muchas mujeres que están... Uh, all right, we are hearing a victory speech from Democrat Sylvia Garcia winning re-election to... Uh, U.S. House in Texas's uh, 29th Congressional District there. She is speaking from election headquarters at NRG, and of course, AP is calling her victory now. So we brought you her speech, and we'll have more on this coming up in a little bit, but Ron, we'll go no to you now. Okay, and, okay, uh, and okay. Uh, the Associated Press is reporting that Dan Crenshaw has won his race. And with that, we go to Vlad Davidyuk. He's a GOP strategist and political analyst. Uh, a welcome, Vlad. First of all, what's your take on some of these races, uh, Dan Crenshaw and Sylvia Garcia? Uh, I think uh, neither I one was a race with a race with a race with a race One of those things where, things where you know that both of these candidates have well-established support, uh, and they had built a lot of uh, grassroots activists who were campaigning on the ground on their behalf. Uh, certainly, uh, Democrats were targeting Dan Crenshaw. Uh, they thought he might have been vulnerable, uh, but clearly his support has has been growing since he got elected. He's worked very hard to build that strong network of support throughout CD2. Uh, Sylvia Garcia, uh, she, she's insurmountable in CD29. I mean, it's, it, it's a district that was specifically created for uh, Democrats to win that largely Hispanic uh, middle uh, middle class, lower middle class community, and so she's she's the perfect candidate for that particular demographic that seems to consistently support candidates that align with those values. Gene Green setting the table for that, so it's not a surprise. Vlad, a lot Vlad. of attention obviously on the presidential race right now, but let's talk about Texas and what Texas lawmakers are trying to do. Republicans trying to hold on to their power, Democrats trying to maybe turn the state blue. Uh, how do you see that going tonight? It's still kind of early, though, obviously. No, it's still it's still very early, and and we're still looking to see some numbers out of different areas of, across Texas where those indicators are really going to give us a much more firm understanding of of the of where the voters are. But based on these numbers that we're seeing early on, it's very uh, encouraging for Republicans, certainly this early in the evening, to see uh, somebody like Dan Crenshaw performing at this particular uh, high of a level uh, and and blunting the support that his Democrat opponent had tried to build. I mean, we had outside um, politicians who were coming in from the Democrat side. Certainly, Beto O'Rourke was working very hard to try to flip CD2. Um, and there's other candidates who have actually been funneling money and funneling support for candidates trying to flip these districts. So we haven't really seen that materialize yet. Uh, and it seems as if at this point, uh, those Republican incumbents are, are going to be making those uh, districts relatively safe. And you're a GOP strategist. Uh, you know, Texas has been red for so many decades now. I'm old enough to remember when it was blue, but it's been red for many decades. Uh, a, a lot has been uh, said about perhaps uh, Texas at some point becoming blue. Uh, do you see that happening? Are, do, what do you think about all this talk about Texas becoming blue? 
Well, look, uh, uh, Texas becoming blue is not a question of necessarily demographics or pol politics at this point. It's a question of responsiveness from uh, leaders at the local, state, and federal level. And as long as uh, Republicans continue to provide the kinds of response and the kinds of service that their constituents are seeking, uh, they'll be able to maintain their position in office. It really depends on how well they respond to those changes and those needs. Given that demographics are changing, given that uh, the politics do have a, a significant influence on whether or not those incumbents stay in office, it's income, it, 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 it behooves those Republican incumbents to go ahead and find ways to make sure that they're hearing all their constituents and make sure that they're addressing those needs consistently. Um, otherwise, yeah, they could be setting the table to get themselves kicked out of office. Presidential race. Presidential race. Uh, a few months ago, everybody was saying, you know, Trump would have no problem taking Texas, but in recent weeks, uh, that's been, you know, called, uh, that's, that's been a dispute. Uh, people are saying that Biden could win Texas. And if Biden wins Texas, what do you think happens to the president's chances of being reelected? Well, no, I mean, if, if, if Biden were to win Texas, it's effectively the end of uh, the Trump presidency. Uh, President Trump cannot uh, win uh, re-election without Texas. It's such a huge keystone for the Republican Party. It's, it's functionally equivalent to California for the Democrats. Um, I, I don't anticipate Texas turning blue, certainly not tonight, certainly not in the subsequent uh next two or three, two or four years. But down the road, again, uh, when those demographic changes continue to build and those uh, Democrat politicians who have been elected continue to get reelected and build up that resume and build up their, uh, their record of achievement, they're going to have a much stronger uh, opportunity to, to make an argument for reelection. Uh, it's incumbent upon Republicans to continue to try to find ways to answer the needs of their constituents and continue to build the bench of new candidates to take place of, of retiring office holders. Um, for tonight, I think uh, Texas will remain safely red. I think President Trump will carry Texas. Okay, but if he, if he carries Texas, there's still some other battleground states that he must win. He must win Pennsylvania, correct? I mean, one of those one of those Midwest uh, blue wall states is going to have to fall uh, to President Trump in order for him to have the the victory that he's actually seeking. Um, certainly, this early in the evening, Florida is looking very promising, uh, but Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, all those states are very key for him to be able to maintain. Um, his his tenure as president of the United States, he won't be able to be he won't be able to prevail unless he has some significant victories in those states. Do you think we'll do you think we'll have a decision tonight, or do you think this is going to take days and weeks to come? Be tough, especially given especially given a state like Pennsylvania. Uh, the the returns there could could be delayed coming out. Same thing for a state like uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Ohio and Michigan uh, seem to be a little bit more promising in terms of delivering quicker results. Um, so we should see some of that, uh, some of those returns rather soon. Uh, but uh, there's some there's some counties in, in Pennsylvania that should start giving us some very early indicators as to how well Republicans are performing there and giving us those kind of insights as to where President Trump will be going. Let's go back to early voting and the, and the record numbers here in Texas. What do you attribute that to? I'm sure there's obviously uh, a lot of factors, but is it primarily uh, the president or is it primarily because of COVID-19 people uh, deciding to uh, vote early rather than on election day? It's all the above. This is, a, this is a, a letter E, all the above kind of situation. People wanted to vote early because they didn't know what the COVID situation was going to be. They didn't know what the polling place situation was going to be. There was a lot of speculation very early on as to what polling places could be open, which polling places um, might might have issues. Um, certainly the issues with the, 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 the PPE that were required and, and the, uh, the clerks and the, the election judges who were on site addressed those concerns. You saw a lot of those 
uh, posts on social media from those election judges talking about the amount of, of protective equipment that they had to take to their polling places and, and the precautions that they had to take. So voters were aware of those things. Additionally, I really believe that you know, at the start of early voting, since Governor Abbott has expanded early voting, I think a lot of people decided to lock that vote in a little bit early before uh, they normally would have because the opportunity was presented to them. And then you saw a lot of people, especially on the Democrat side, who have been waiting for four years to cast their ballot against President Trump, and they jumped at the opportunity. Um, at the same time, you see people on the other side who were waiting for four years to cast another vote to support President Trump. And you saw those in high propensity Republican areas as well. So you have a lot of factors moving Republicans and Democrats to the polling places to cast their vote as early as they possibly could so that they could also, you know, go help out, you know, do some grassroots activism, and get out block walking. Thank you so much, you so Vlad Davidyuk, a GOP strategist and political analyst. We'll be talking to you later in the night. Rekha. Thank you. Uh, so more numbers are coming in now. AP reporting that Democrat Al Green has won re-election for Texas's 9th Congressional District. Green has held this spot for, since 2005. And as Ron just mentioned, as he was speaking with Vlad, the Associated Press just calling a victory for Republican Dan Crenshaw for District 2. Crenshaw re-elected to his second congressional term. Jason Miles at the Houstonian, where Crenshaw's team has gathered for the night. Jason, I'm sure there are a lot of happy people there. Yeah, overheard your conversation with Vlad there. A lot of happy GOP years here tonight for sure in an event space inside the Houstonian Hotel here, just on the other side of the loop in the uh, Galleria area. People started arriving maybe an hour or so ago. This event was supposed to get started around seven o'clock. I'm not sure Congressman Crenshaw expected to give a victory speech as soon as he might. We're keeping watch for that here uh, via a feed inside, but I can tell you that a lot of people are excited about Crenshaw's service to District 2. He was elected, as you know, a couple of years ago and some political insiders back then really didn't expect him to get very far in the uh, Republican primary. He went on in to win a runoff uh, in the Republican primary and then, of course, took the seat in District 2, a freshman congressman now going into his second term thanks to a victory tonight. As you mentioned, the AP calling that race. His Democratic challenger named Seema Lajavardian, a attorney, an immigrant, a breast cancer survivor, health care on the top of her platform list. I met with her at a polling place up in Spring today. District 2, a very oddly shaped district that encompasses parts of Kingwood, Humble, Spring, the Heights, Montrose, West U, it kind of circles around uh, the, the inner loop and includes some neighborhoods inside the loop as well. But uh, certainly she uh, uh, not uh, getting the victory she wanted tonight, but of course she probably also expected this would be an uphill battle against a very high profile and popular um, in many circles. Congressman Dan Crenshaw, a former Navy SEAL and a veteran, uh, his trademark eye patch emblazoned on many things inside tonight, including some masks, which are mandatory during tonight's victory party. We're watching a feed from in here, and uh, his challenger, uh, known as Seema, should be giving a speech as well. I'm told her event tonight was planned to be virtual. We'll keep an eye on things for now. We'll send it back to you. All right, Jason Miles, live from the Houstonian. Thank you so much, Jason. You know, 270 is the magic number. That's the number of electoral votes a presidential candidate needs to secure the White House. They do not need to win the popular vote. Jason Puckett and the Verify team are explaining the difference. Viewer Lois A. asked, if the Electoral College determines the president, why do we even vote? Why is the popular vote so important? Well, we're answering Lois' question and breaking down the basics of the Electoral College using a variety of sources, including reports by the Congressional Research Service, U.S. codes, the U.S. Constitution, and Supreme Court rulings. So, if the Electoral College determines the president, why do we vote? Well, a recent Supreme Court ruling sums it up well. Quote, when Americans cast ballots for presidential candidates, their votes actually go towards selecting members of the Electoral College. And that happens in four steps. First, during the campaign, both parties put together a list of elector nominees in each state. These can basically be anyone who's not currently in a federal office. Step two, we vote. As the Supreme Court explained, we're actually voting for the electors that were nominated by the party we vote for. So if you vote Biden-Harris, you're actually voting for the Democratic electors. And if you vote Trump-Pence, you're voting for the Republican electors. 
Step three, the vote is counted and electors are chosen. Now, U.S. code says this has to be done by December 8th. In 48 states, it's winner take all. So if a party gets 51% of the popular vote, all the electors in that state will be from that party. Maine and Nebraska are the exceptions. They split their electoral votes. Finally, step four. Electors officially vote for the candidates of their party to be president and vice president. This actually happens on December 14th, more than a month after we all vote. Electors are supposed to follow the popular vote of their state, and 33 states require it by law. So to answer Lois' question, why do we vote? Well, our votes decide who was in the Electoral College, and the Electoral College votes to decide who wins the election. Now, this system does mean that a candidate can win the national popular vote and lose the overall election. Like in 2016, when Hillary Clinton had roughly 3 million more votes than Donald Trump, but Trump won 304 electoral votes, only 270 are needed to be elected. Folks, if you've got other questions about the election you want us to look into, send us an email. With your Verify, I'm Jason Puckett. All right, let's go to Dan Crenshaw right now giving his victory speech. Pray for our president, and uh, you don't need to wish me good luck anymore. We, <laughs> we it. Oh, yeah. Not even close. Not even close. Thank you guys so much for coming. We will be back. We're going to be right back. I just want more of your fellow patriots to be here, and then we're going to have a really fun time. Promise you that. Thank you guys so much. All right, everyone. We were just listening to Dan Crenshaw take the podium for just a few minutes. He's promising to go back up there. Uh, he had a, a victory tonight, uh, second time he's been elected. Uh, we are obviously watching many more races tonight watching them all, and he's uh, one of the few winners that we've got so far. Uh, we mentioned earlier that Congresswoman Sheila, uh, uh, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia uh, has won, and uh, Al Green has won as well. So we've got at least three winners that we know of, but as we've been saying all day long, it's gonna take longer than usual to count up all the votes tonight. It might take several days, but we might, uh, we might be surprised by how many races are actually decided tonight. Uh, we've got uh, our crew, all, our crews all over the Houston area and all over the state actually uh, watching what's going on. Such a historic election uh, for this country and uh, probably uh, we, we hope we never have an election like this in terms of a pandemic uh, being, you know, casting a shadow over everything. Let's hope we don't have another pandemic four years from now. As I said, we've never had an election like this one, and we might be waiting past election night for a winner. David Schechter explains. CBS projects that Senator Barack Obama of Illinois will be the next president. CNN projects that Barack Obama will be reelected. That Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. As Americans, we're used to knowing on election night who won. 
But a new survey from the Pew Research Center shows we're getting kind of worried that on election day, we won't know. It found only half of us are very or somewhat confident that we'll know within a day or two who will be our president. So people are feeling a little anxious. What should we expect election day to be like? Let's start with a basic expectation. Several election officials tell me, unless the voters give one candidate an overwhelming victory, it's likely we will not know on election night who won the presidency. Why is that? Well, mostly you can blame it on how a fear of COVID-19 has created a surge in demand for mail-in ballots across the country. Every mail-in ballot has to be opened and processed and there will be more than anyone's ever seen. So the counting will take a lot of time. Tony Pippins Poole is the top elections official in Dallas County. She says some mail-in ballots can also continue to arrive after election day. That could be a substantial amount of ballots still coming in, which you normally do not have in a typical election. So if a race is close and ballots are still coming in, that will slow down the process of certifying a winner. On election day, you should also expect to hear about problems at the polls. There are 230,000 polling locations in the US, so mistakes and misconduct are bound to happen, and they often do. But Susan Motley with the Irving chapter of the League of Women Voters says isolated problems do not mean the system is rigged or failing. I strongly believe that we have a strong election system in place. It's a system I'm proud of and want to encourage people to participate in and really exercise their voice. Okay, last point. If it's not clear who won in the days following the election, what happens next? Well, over the next two to three weeks, depending on the state, elections officials will first finalize the results. After that, if there are legal challenges, states have till December 8th to settle them. By December 14th, the Electoral College meets to finalize the overall results. And by January 20th, someone must be sworn into the office. If it gets that far, we will be exhausted for sure and probably pretty anxious, but it won't mean the process is flawed. It will mean the process is being followed. All right, we continue to follow election results as they come in, but first, a uh, history lesson of sorts. Our voting process is an important part of our democracy, and it hasn't always worked the same way. Sharon Coe explains how voting has changed over the years. The U.S. elections have come a long way in nearly two and a half centuries. It's hard to visualize the Electoral College, initially made up of 10 states with only 69 electors total, now nearly eight times as large, with 538 electors across 50 states. Here's how it worked. Each elector received two votes. The person with the majority of votes became president, and the person with the second most became vice president. And forget about political parties and massive campaigns. President George Washington was summoned to serve. Think of it as one big write-in ballot. If people saw you as a leader, you were granted the position. It was no contest in 1789. The Electoral College unanimously voted for President Washington. Vice President John Adams received 34 of the other votes. Perhaps the biggest difference between then and now, the public did not get to vote. As late as 1816, citizens of nine states were not able to cast a ballot, and it wasn't until November 4th, 1845, that the U.S. held its first uniform election day, meaning all states voted on the same day. Still, not all U.S. citizens were given the right to vote until 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed. That was just 55 years ago. The legislation ensured all men and women aged 21 and older, regardless of race, religion, or education, the right to vote without discrimination. A tradition continued today where every citizen of the United States over the age of 18 has the privilege to cast a ballot. Perhaps one of the many reasons it's so important to make your voice heard in 2020. All right, we're going to go live now to Energy Arena, where you see Sheila Jackson Lee and giving her victory speech. Let's take a, take a listen. Night. Texas will be an example of how long that night can be. For those of us who are looking for uh, a transformational change with the election of President-to-be Joe Biden and Vice President-to-be Kamala Harris and electing Democrats across the nation, we believe that America has finally 
reached an understanding of meeting her values uh, with our Constitution, uh, which opening lines say, to create a more perfect union. I've been listening to the numbers in Florida and some of the preliminary states. All of the numbers are not in, but those numbers are turning blue. In this state, we are now a microcosm of African Americans, Latinx, young voters, Anglo voters, and elder voters who are voting Democrat. Uh, we are, frankly, uh, beating the odds. I don't know what the ultimate results will be, uh, but I believe that we will have a mountainous results. I don't want to count any votes before they are counted, but as you well know, we had an enormous fight in this state to stop voter suppression, starting with the passing of the law, the voter ID law that we went to the federal court on, that was ultimately determined at the lower court level that it was unconstitutional and overturned when we went on the appeal court. But ever since we started voting, uh, we have had to remove the 11 sites for early vote, for ballot votes, mail ballot votes. We've had a start and stop on the legalities of the drive through voting, but our voters kept coming out. Our elections team here did a, a, a unbelievable job. And if you read our laws, they met the legal standards during early vote for drive through voting. There was no doubt uh, that the structures were standing structures and they were appropriate structures for voting. But we kept getting pounded by Republicans, one thing after another. And yesterday, a collective number of us were at the courthouse, and frankly, even the judge could not believe the arguments being made by the opposition. And that is the illegalities, allegedly, of the count of 127,000 votes and to stop drive through voting. Well, a week ago last Friday, we voted a million votes. And today, as I travel throughout Harris County, people from all backgrounds, Republicans, Democrats, and independents, and others, voted quietly and respectfully. But I think the ultimate determination will be, I hope, a miraculous count for Texas uh, turning blue. And it will be an impossible dream that we have seized. And finally, a reckoning of recognition that in this state, we give dignity to all people. We don't take away anyone's rights. And the people who went to vote, hoping that we are successful, voted because they wanted to be respected. They wanted to have dignity. They wanted to make sure that, in fact, they had a seat at the table. They were tired of being isolated and denigrated. And I am joyful tonight. For the early numbers, even if they're just early numbers, shows that those voters are going to be heard tonight throughout the nation. And voters in different states, even in Florida, Virginia, Ohio, their voices are being heard. That's what democracy is. That's what our nation stands for. And I tell you, darn it, that's what I'm excited about. Because I live every day. As the nation counts its votes, we may have a change. And finally, to all of those families who've lost lives, lost loved ones, with COVID-19, we finally, as a government, may be unified to, one, honor their deaths and respect the loss and mourn with them, but we finally may get a national plan to be able to save lives. That's what the federal government does when the federal government is working. So as I indicated, Sheila Jackson Lee, I serve on the Judiciary Committee, Homeland Security Committee, and Budget Committee. Tonight is a potential night of great, enormous celebration when America comes together, America is unified, and America is healed. I think that is an enormous 
accomplishment for all of the voters that came out across America. I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, that is uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee just finishing up her victory speech at Election Central. Her reelection means she's going to serve a 14th term in the House, representing most of Central Houston. An incredibly popular Congresswoman, so no surprise to political experts and voters, Ron, that she won this race. And no surprise there. And then she hit on many of the topics that she's been quite vocal on. Uh, coronavirus itself, and uh, she's been very instrumental in getting test sites throughout the Houston area. And then she uh, delved into the topic of drive through voting and the, uh, the legal fight that we had on, uh, on that this week and uh, those votes being counted finally. Well, let's move on now. Uh, with somebody who has covered elections as long as I have here in Houston. Bob Stein, our political analyst, always with his insight to shed a little light on what's happening in terms of trends and, of course, what's happening tonight. So we have these winners so far. We have Dan Crenshaw. We've got Al Green, Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, Sylvia Garcia. Uh, no surprises in any of those, Bob. No, I, I actually I wouldn't say a surprise. I think Vlad hit it right. Dan Crenshaw, we, we quickly forget recent history. This is a guy that ran for the primary uh, against a well-established uh, state representative, Mr. Roberts, and of course, an incredibly well-financed Ms. Wall. And he comes in surprising everybody. I, I think sometimes character, candidacy uh, matter. I'm not necessarily saying that Dan Crenshaw is a seasoned, experienced elected official, but um, I think what he's done here is, is not remarkable, but strong. Problem, it's gonna be redistricting. Um, he's going to look at Mr. McCall just up the road. They got to find a place for him. I think they will. I think they'll carve out a nice district and make him safe. He's probably in many ways the future. Um, I, I'll say this. Um, you don't see too many people under 50 or under 60 running for these offices. And if, if nothing else, Dan Crenshaw is, I wouldn't say young, but clearly probably in, in, in my age, a little far, half my age and closer to Vlad. Um, I think Sheila Jackson Lee is again, just a perennial. Um, she represents her district well, but let's be honest, uh, if you start thinking about where we are going to be going, Vlad brought this up before, Texas is changing demographically. The census allegedly will be done at some time. Will we don't redraw our districts? Texas should have picked up at least three. We might only be picking up two, maybe three. Problem, not enough Republicans to go around. And I might note here, even Sheila Jackson district um, is at, at question here. There's no more uh, Shelby. They won't be necessarily protected for majority minority districts. So it's gonna be really tough drawing out districts. Um, so if you wanna think about where the future is, this is, a, I think, a really important point. We didn't get to this night where I think um, Trump will probably win Texas, but by half, maybe a third of what he won it with in 2016, the state has been changing demographically. And we're seeing that in counties like Harris and Fort Bend, of course, uh, Williams and Collin and Denton are getting close to being, if not competitive already, tilting a slightly purple or blue. This is the inevitability. And I think the quality of the candidates, something we don't talk about anymore, um, may become much more important. Um, I look forward to seeing our, uh, somebody like uh, um, George P. Bush, our, our land commissioner, maybe, maybe taking a challenge to uh, somebody like the Attorney General Paxson. Um, you don't see that too often in a majority party, but I think inevitably, if the party wants to succeed, it's going to have to open up and open up to people who have a different view of how the party should operate and be open to race, ethnicity, and younger voters. But tonight, I think what you're going to see probably is the president winning two and a half, maybe three points, Cornyn doing much better, and some candidates like Crenshaw somewhere in between. But I don't see any big surprises. I'd like to know how uh, Chip Roy is doing up in his House seat against uh, Wendy Davis. I think that's a seat that might uh, tilt towards the Democrats. Um, otherwise, I think even in here in Harris County, Democrats are winning generally. I think the only breakthrough might be in uh, Commissioner District Number Three. That's Steve Raddick's seat, which uh, he held, I think, help me here, 28 years. Uh, Mr. Ramsey, a mayor of a small town along I-10, and Michael Moore, also a non-incumbent new new uh, candidate, chief of staff to Bill White. They're in a reasonably close race, but my guess is, uh, let's looking at from the early vote, which was quite a bit of vote. Uh, tilting towards a Republican Ramsey. 
Let's talk about uh, any of the other races that might not be getting the kind of attention that you think they deserve. How about 134th, uh, Sarah Davis and Ann Johnson? I, I have not looked at that race. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to tilt my head away. I have not seen the numbers there, but I would think that Sarah Davis could be a casualty of what happened to Ed Emmett in 2018, a very popular um, a Republican who had enormous bipartisan support, oftentimes was w winning with um, almost a majority of Democratic vote. Let's see, I'm, I'm running myself through that district and I'm almost there, 134. And yes, Ann Johnson's likely to win that. She has 53 to 46, 47. And I think this is another case of polarization. Uh, as I said, uh, Sarah Davis is, is unique Republican. She had uh, knocked off, I think, help me here, 2010, um, a very, very popular incumbent Democrat, um, Ellen Cohn. And then um, she gets challenged in 218 by a primary opponent backed by the governor, Republican Governor Abbott. Um, she beats off that challenge, gets her nomination, wins handily in 218. I wouldn't say handily, but with a lot of Democratic support. And then she turns around and gets endorsed by Greg Abbott in her run in 2020. And it looks like she will be losing uh, to Ann Johnson with so much of the vote cast early. Um, that's about a, help me, about 6,300 vote margin. It could be made up on election day. We'll see. I don't want to judge. But I'd say like with Michael Moore in the uh, commissioner's race, with such a heavy emphasis on early voting and mail-in voting, and maybe Vlad has a, a, a take on that. But I think a lot of people who like um, Sarah Davis felt like, well, like Ed Emmett, she was in the wrong party. And if she wanted to run as a Democrat, that would have been fine. But people now not voting for candidates anymore. They're voting for parties. They're voting for control, in this case, of the state house. So when we're talking about Texas lawmakers and Texas races, you think we'll probably know before we go to bed tonight, of course, depending on what time we go to bed, uh, who's won and who lost. But what about the presidential election nationwide? I, I think nationwide we're going to win. Well, I, I'm looking at some of the numbers right now. I'm a little surprised about Ohio and North Carolina, but we got to wait. Um, in North Carolina, the president is, seems to be trailing pretty heavily there. Um, I'm looking at numbers off of... Uh, I always like to look at you know both websites, but it looks like in uh, North Carolina um, and Ohio, Biden's doing well, but it's early. Uh, my personal view on this, I think is a lot like Vlad's. I think he'll lose Florida, might win North Carolina, lose Georgia very closely. Um, I think what happens now is Arizona, we won't know for a little bit while though. Well, that's in the, of course, Pacific uh, on, on the West Coast. But I think the key here, it's Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And I'd even take Ohio out. I would have thought the president would win Ohio. So I think there's all three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. What's the problem? Michigan and, Pencil, uh, and, and Wisconsin, they just are not gonna count the votes. Nobody said this, but we all think of counties as counting votes. In Wisconsin, there's 1,700 townships. They are the ones that run the election. There are townships, in Chippewa Falls and Baraboo and little towns in between, Nina, and they will be counting those ballots, paper ballots, by hand, optically scanned. Uh, it'll probably be Tuesday or Wednesday, particularly because there's so many mail-in ballots. Um, Pennsylvania might be a little faster. Um, Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is, and uh, of course, Chester and the Philadelphia area have a little bit more access to technology. Um, they were able to open their ballots um, a little bit earlier. Well this morning, um, but the volume, I think, as that, that said, you're gonna have to win at least one of those three states, if not two, depending upon things like Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona. But my sense is we're not gonna know this probably till early this morning, uh, early Wednesday morning, and maybe a day or two later. The real question mark is if it's as close as um, it appears to be, although again, I'd say Ohio and North Carolina, are big surprises to me. I wish Vlad was in on this. If he sees something different than I do, um, I would not think if 54% of the vote in Ohio and Biden's up by almost 10 points, that could be the Lake counties, you know, around uh, Cleveland and Toledo, which are good Democratic bases, um, but, you know, middle part of the state, particularly uh, in the Franklin County area and then getting into the um, Ohio Valley, I would think the president would do well. Big question here is can the president make up on election day what he's losing on early voting? Um, and, and I'd like to throw a question to Vlad. 
the strategy of the president sort of discouraging people from voting by mail and even discouraging early voting, that seemed to put handicap um, the president and Republicans in general. Um, of course, down ballot candidates on the Republican side might be running better in states like Texas, Ohio, and other battleground. And the president's not considering that by discouraging people from voting these down ballot races, particularly with you know more time to do a write-in ballot, um, he may be hurting the party, but helping himself. So um, at this point, I think it, we just have to wait. I think Pennsylvania becomes for me, they call it the Keystone State for, no, for a reason. I think it will be really important there. And the Western part of that state is where the president is very, very strong, particularly in the Allegheny, Allegheny County areas around Pittsburgh. Not Pittsburgh per se, but all those suburban communities. Um, that's where I think uh, the president, if he's gonna win Pennsylvania like he did and help me hear about 11,000 votes in 2016, that's where he's gonna have to get it. Well, everybody has to realize that we're talking, you know, each state has different methods for, for voting, first of all, and there's different time zones as well. Well, yeah, I mean, we, I mean we're, we're mostly in the East Coast. I think Florida runs a very good operation, notwithstanding maybe Broward County in the past few years, but Florida has, um, looks like it's gonna pretty much count up its vote. I think they're at 90% um, counted. Um, I think the president wins looking like two points there, a little less than two points. Um, uh, that's less, of course, than he did in 2016. Maybe I'm off on that, but not a big surprise. Um, I think the surprise tonight so far are what I'm seeing in states like um, Ohio, North Carolina. Georgia's a real surprise. I still think the president pulls that out, but that one's as close as less than a half a point. Um, uh, we don't have all the election day vote in either, but again, so much vote coming out of the cab, you know, Atlanta. Um, and it's, it's a close race we saw in 218 with Ms. Abrams and, the, and now Governor Kemp, then the Secretary of State Kemp, who was running the election while he was governor. Um, but that's, that's a big surprise. And that's clearly the success of mostly African-American and young white um, voters in, that, in those, what I call suburbs of, if we can call it that, all the way around uh, the Cab County and, and, and Atlanta. Um, but I still think that one has to tilt towards the president. I, I think if he loses Georgia tonight, it's sort of like losing Texas, I think, in some respects. You lose Georgia, and it's really a very hard path for the president. Okay. I think he needs Arizona, Georgia, and Florida. All right. Well, we'll leave it there for now, Bob. Uh, and we'll be talking to Vlad Davidyuk, who you've been referring to uh, several times. We'll be talking to him uh, later in the evening as well. Thanks so much for your insight. Bob Stein, our political analyst. You know, Rob, uh, we're getting our first look now. If we go back to Election Central, uh, this is a live look, and we're seeing the first boxes of Election Day results, those ballots for Harris County showing up to be counted. There's uh, equipment coming in, ballots coming in, so we're taking a live look at that right now. Of course, a lot of people working really hard to get these votes counted, so it's, it's going to be yeah. a long night Democracy there. in action right there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So again, we are taking a live look election headquarters. You see them bringing all those stuff from polling locations. Again, the first ballots arriving at Election Center, which is uh, Energy Arena, and they'll be counting things there. Our Adam Bennett is live there as well. So hopefully we'll get an update from him in just a few moments. But first, we are going to go back out to Fort Bend County. And again, we've been talking about the congressional race for District 22. Shree Preston Cool Kearney versus Fort Bend County Sheriff Troy Nels. Grace White following this race really closely. Grace, any updates? Rake and Ron, good evening. We got some early results we want to share with you now in the race between Shree Preston Kulkarni and Troy Nels. Nels up right now 50% over Kulkarni 45%. But keep in mind it's early. This is only with 26% of precincts reporting. Again, that's Nels up 50% to Kulkarni's 45%. We also want to show you some video from earlier this evening here at Smart Financial Center. We saw a steady stream of voters all day here but no long lines. County election officials tell us they believe that's because so many people in Fort Bend County voted early. But the important thing to remember about 
the Texas 22 race is that this congressional district covers not just Fort Bend County, but also parts of Harris and Brazoria County. So we have to wait for results from all three of those counties before we know which way this race will go. We did catch up with Sheree Preston Colcarney here at Smart Financial Center a few hours ago. Here's what he told us. There's a very clear distinction in this race, in this election here in Texas 22 and across the country between science and anti-science, between democracy and anti-democracy, between inclusion and exclusion. And from the numbers that we've seen and the people coming out, I think that people are going to stand up for our health care. They're going to stand up for the education of our children. They're going to stand up for the, our economy and those small businesses who are struggling right now. We're going to have a return to science tonight. Uh, we're going to have a return to an inclusive society where everybody gets a seat at the table and everybody has a voice in our democracy. Cole Carney is holding a virtual watch party with his supporters tonight. Nels is hosting an in-person watch party out in the Fort Bend County area. We're expecting him to arrive there shortly, and we will be interviewing him once he arrives. A spokesman for the Nels campaign told us today they believe Nels is the candidate that is the most trusted and well-known in this community. They are encouraged by the turnout today, and they think that could give him the advantage going into tonight. Ron and Reka, we'll send it back to you. All right, Grace, thank you so much. We want to talk more about this congressional race, but first back to election headquarters where Harris County Clerk Chris Holland is speaking right now. Let's time. get to that. And of course, my dedicated staff who have made this election safe, secure, accessible, fair, and efficient for the 2.5 million registered voters of Harris County. Now, it turns out that when you provide voters with greater access, they're more likely to decide to exercise their right to vote. And that's why we shattered early voting records with over 1.4 million voters casting their ballots early in this election. 127,000 of those voted using drive-through voting. And over 10,000 voters took advantage of 24-hour voting. Both of these firsts in the history of Texas. We tripled the number of early voting locations from 2016. We brought in 50% more voting machines. We optimized our wait time tools so that voters could make a decision on where they could cast their vote in a way that was most convenient for them. And of course, we had an outpouring of community support with so many Houston area organizations stepping up to offer their facilities as voting centers and their staff to serve as election workers. Our partnerships with Houses of Worship, the Houston Food Bank, the Rockets, the Texans, the Dynamo, HISD, and the Texas Medical Center, just to name a few, provided voters with more voting spaces that were larger and ultimately safer. During the early voting period, I've visited all 122 early voting centers. And I did so to thank those election workers for their commitment to Harris County and to their neighbors, and to ensure that we were following the strict safety protocols that we put in place. And during those visits, I heard over and over from election workers and voters alike how safe they felt working during that time and casting their ballots during that time. And of course, about how much voters loved drive through voting. The number one question I got about drive through voting was why didn't we do this sooner? And can you ensure that we have this in the future? And the answer is yes. Some stories struck me in particular. From the nurse who cried after learning that she could vote at the medical center in between the 12 to 14 hour shifts that she's been working since February, who said that accessible voting took one thing off of her plate at the end of her stressful day. To the welders, electricians, and shift workers that support our oil and gas industry, who were able to vote at 2 a.m. at the only time that was convenient for them. To the veteran with PTSD, the woman whose parent was immunocompromised, and the mom with small children, who each said that drive through voting made it possible for them to cast their ballots. To the first-time voters who voted with their friends at local universities 
like Texas Southern, Rice, U of H, Prairie View, HCC, and Lone Star. I can report that throughout the day, today, there were nearly no lines at our 800 voting locations. I'm sure that made your reporting experience a lot more boring than you expected. At this time, every single one of our locations are closed. Every Harris County voter has cast their vote in this historic election. And today, just over 200,000 Harris County residents voted in person, with total in-person voting reaching 1.47 million. Those exact figures are about 202,700 who voted in person today, and 1.4, again, 1.47 million in total who voted in person. Today, 1,250 voters cast their ballots at the Toyota Center drive through location. And that's in addition to the 127,000 who voted using drive through voting during the early voting period. We received a total of 179,000 mail ballots. We had 45,000 voters who originally applied to vote by mail, but ultimately decided to cast their votes in person. And there are still 25,000 mail ballots out there. We will continue to await those mail ballots through 5 p.m. tomorrow, and we will count all of those that were postmarked by today at 7 p.m. And so at this moment, the total vote count is 1.65 million, which is more than 300,000 votes beyond the Harris County record that was set in 2016 and roughly 67% turnout here in Harris County. We are thrilled that so many Harris County voters came together and made their voices heard at the polls. And at this time, election judges are already pouring into the gates of NRG Park to deliver those results to our central counting station. And so we'll keep you updated as we tabulate those votes throughout the night. And here's hoping that it will be a short night. At this time, I'll take any questions that you might have. Chris, what do you think the timeline is for county votes throughout the night? What do you expect to be done? So as I mentioned, cars are already starting to roll in, which uh, you know, one of our safe elections initiatives was to increase the speed at which we get these results out. Uh, back in July, during our, our, our primary runoff, uh, we had results that started to roll in um, around 8.30. Tonight, there were judges coming in at 7.45, uh, so that's encouraging. We have 14 drive-through drop-off lines outside. Each of those lines, which is able to hold uh, three vehicles at a time, so we're able to process over 40 vehicles at a time as they come in. And so, um, you know, we're thinking that this will be a few hours. Uh, I would love to get out of here before midnight. Uh, but of course, we're going to take the time to make sure that all 800 of those locations are able to get their results here and we're able to get them in, tabulate them, and report them out to the voters of Harris County. One more, if I may, Chris. Just after the Fifth Circuit's ruling, um, are there any outstanding legal challenges or are they all resolved? And how confident are you that every single vote cast today? Uh, we're extremely confident that every vote cast in this entire election will be counted. Those, vote, those that were cast today, as well as those that were cast during the early voting uh, period. Uh, the Fifth Circuit you know, made clear what Judge Hannon made astoundingly clear, which is that drive-through voting is 100% legal, period, plain and simple. Um, you know, the, there have been litigants uh, who have chosen uh, to do their best to suppress votes here in Texas and to show that they will stop at nothing uh, to fight against the constitutional right to vote in this country. Uh, but my job is to protect the right to vote. Uh, each of my election workers takes an oath to count the votes that come in and to make sure they do everything in their power uh, to ensure that the voters' uh, preferences uh, are delivered ultimately through their votes being counted and cast. And so, uh, you know, we feel that, that we are in the clear. 
Of course, they may, they may, they, there very well may be another frivolous lawsuit cast tomorrow, um, but we're going to win that one too, and these votes are going to count. So the, the law in Texas is that your mail ballot must either be hand delivered to us by 7 p.m. on election night, or it must be postmarked by 7 p.m. on election night and turned in to us uh, by 5 p.m. the following day. And so we will still be receiving mail ballots tomorrow. Uh, as I mentioned, um, through our math, there are about 25,000 mail ballots that were sent out that currently have not made it back to us. Now, not all 25,000 of those are going to come in, uh, but certainly some fraction of those are going to come in this evening and tomorrow before 5 p.m., and we're going to count those votes. Uh, there will also be just, you know, a much smaller number, but there will be those that come from overseas that have an additional five days to get to us, and those that come from overseas military that have an additional six days to get to us. Those are always, you know, pretty minuscule numbers, uh, but those do exist, and we're going to count every single vote. All right, we've been listening to Harris County Clerk Chris Hollins talk about the Herculean task of organizing a presidential election in Harris County during a pandemic, talking about shattering records with 24-hour voting, drive through voting, more voting machines, larger venues, and all the corona safety measures that were taken uh, during all the voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris Hollins, I mean, very plainly and simply said, when you give people access, they're more likely to vote. And that's exactly what he believes Harris County did with the 24 hour voting and of course the drive through voting, um, talking about how popular that was. Ron, I talked to a lot of moms who said, look, this was the only way I could get to the polls and I could vote is put my kids in the back of the car, do the drive through voting um, and, and get my ballot in. And that was huge for people. I think it was really great when he mentioned also uh, talking about health care workers at the medical center and having a polling place there and seeing how beneficial that was because these folks are on the front line of a pandemic. And so creating that access for them and giving them a chance to vote, especially with early voting as well, um, was really huge. And was it 1.65 million people voting in Harris County? Was that the number that I heard? Uh, there were so many numbers thrown out. Yeah. But, uh, it, it, as I said, it's just a, such a huge huge task yeah. that we had here in Harris County during the pandemic and we had record breaking uh, records uh, just uh, shattering all these records mm -hmm. and Chris Hollins just basically telling us what has happened and what still might still might happen there still be might there there might still be some challenges to the drive through voting yeah, absolutely. But he did also mention that, you know, some of those things like the 24 hour voting and the drive through voting, he wants those things to stick around. Um, you know, this is the first time that you 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 could go to any polling place um, to vote and the drive through voting and the 24 hour voting were also methods that proved to be very successful um, in this big, large voter turnout that we were seeing. So he wants those things to stick around. And I think a lot of people would agree with. Him yeah, on it's, that. Like, it's like Bob Stein said, once you let the genie out of the bottle, it's going to be hard to put it back in in future elections. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so just before we heard from Chris Hollins, we were talking to Grace White about District 22 and the race there, Shree Preston Cole Kearney and Fort Bend County Sheriff Troy Nels looking to represent one of the fastest growing districts in the country. Uh, Cole Kearney has been a fundraising juggernaut, but Nels is obviously a very familiar face in that district. This is a very interesting race. Uh, Vlad Davidjuk, I know that you have been you following have been this following. congressional race. So my question is, is this a true toss up? Uh, it's difficult to say. I think um, certainly Troy Nels uh, is very familiar to Fort Bend County voters. He's been sheriff there for a long time. Um, that said, um, he prevailed in the primary by showcasing his closeness to President Trump by showing how he, how he aligns with President Trump and his policy preferences and what he's trying to achieve. And then after the primary, he immediately scrubbed his website of any references to President Trump and tried to distance himself and tack back to the center. I think that that probably hurt him a little bit with a lot of Republican voters and a lot of uh, people in those uh, conservative groups who are looking for somebody to f continue in the mold of somebody like Pete Olson, 
who was a staunch conservative and, and really didn't really apologize for it. Uh, Cole Carney has done a lot of excellent groundwork in terms of building his grassroots uh, network. He's, as you mentioned earlier, he did an, an outstanding job in raising a ton of money. A lot of it came from outside, but uh, it doesn't matter because money is money at this point in this in, in the game. And he's actually used that money in an effective way to get his message out. His ads have uh, been going around and been seen by almost every single voter in CD22. And so uh, he's, he's made that effort to push his message out and it's been effective. Yeah, we, we were looking at, at cool, Carney, cool Carney and his platform, and, you know, when he talks about specifics, he was talking about police accountability, he called for a ban on chokeholds, and um, he really kind of positions himself, though, as sort of a moderate Democrat, a lot of people think. Um, you know, he stops short of endorsing the Green New Deal, so for a lot of folks, that's appealing. But when we look at this district, it spans Pearland and Missouri City and Sugarland. It's really one of the most diverse districts in the country. Uh, is that going Going to be advantageous for either candidate? Well, it's it's advantageous depending on how you use it. I mean, uh, Troy Nils, like, I, like we said, has been sheriff of Fort Bend County for a long time. So he has that name recognition. He has that connection with the voters and he understands the constituency. But the question is, how has he used that knowledge and how has he used that familiarity to advance his campaign? And in, in comparison to what Kulkarni has been doing, uh, it, it, it's not been as effective, it seems. Uh, and that's reflected in some of these early numbers. Uh, certainly uh, the, the long primary that really uh, took a beating on these candidates in the Republican side uh, was a detriment to uh, Niels' candidacy. Um, he had a, a, an extensive primary contest with a, with a wide field of candidates and it went to a runoff. Uh, and that extended it even further, and that took time, that took resources, that took money that he could have been dedicating to building up a case. And so he, he kind of started off at a disadvantage when Kulkarni was able to coast through. And I wanted to talk about money because when we looked at the primary runoff when Nels was facing Kathleen Wall, who seemed to have endless amounts of money, we saw her ads everywhere. Um, he managed to pull on a victory there, but then he is now facing Cool Carney, who has a lot of money in that war chest, and Nels really couldn't keep up with um, with that. So, is that going to hurt him at all? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it blunted the positivity of his ability to get out a good message. Um, when you have limited funds, when you have fewer resources to be able to get those messages out, you have to be more selective with what you present to the people. And sometimes that doesn't give you the chance to push out that positive message that you would have rather had that reflects the policies you'd like to do and the way you want to connect with the constituents. Instead, you have to go negative or you have to find ways to attack your opponent. And a lot of times that winds up backfiring and uh, bringing your support down. And so Nails has encountered that because he came into the general contest at a disadvantage because he had been pummeled in both uh, the the initial primary and the runoff. So he, Kulkarni was able to take that war chest and use it much more effectively. Uh, still, it's kind of been a Republican stronghold since 2008 with Pete Olson. So that should help Nels in a lot of ways, right? Well, I mean, it, it's been a Republican stronghold, but that's also kind of a misnomer because it was a it was a Republican stronghold while the demographics were slowly changing. But there's been an acceleration in the recent years. And also those people who have started coming in during the Pete Olson um, uh, tenure uh, now start getting to the point where they're voting age and, and or they're or they're more familiar with the process and they're actively becoming more actively engaged. And so it, you have to win those voters as well. Um, and a lot of those voters um, are voting for the first time in this election. Now, Republicans made huge advances in terms of uh, reaching out to those voters in the last two years. The Fort Bend County Republican Party was really involved in trying to reach out to the Indian American community, the Pakistani community, uh, trying to find ways to bridge those gaps. Um, but uh, it, it appears, based on the numbers we're seeing now and based on, on, on the early returns, it seems like it may have been a little bit too little too late and uh, Kulkarni is taking advantage of that opportunity. All right, Vlad, thank right, you Vlad, so right. much. I know you're going to stick around. Um, we are going to be here for several hours talking about this as the uh, results uh, come in and uh, we'll check in with you in a little bit. Thanks, Vlad.
be here for several hours. I mm -hmm. left my coffee on the other side of the room, <laughs> though. All right. Uh, one of the tools that we have tonight is our election tracker. Marcelino Benito is in front of that, analyzing what's, uh, you know, what's, what some of these results are showing. Hey, Marcelino. Hey there, Ron. Well, this is the electoral map as it stands right now in 2020. You see Biden is in the lead right now with 122 electoral votes. Trump has 92. But if you look at this map, there's no real surprises here. Everything we expected to play out so far has happened both for President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden. If you look back at the 2016 map, you see besides the extra races we haven't called that were red, everything matches so far in 2020. So what will we be watching? Like everyone else across the country, we're still watching those toss-up states of North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, although Florida seems like it's leaning towards Trump uh, by a small, small margin. Ohio, you heard Bob talk about how Joe Biden is still leading in Ohio at this point. That's a bit of a surprise. And of course, we're going to be watching that upper Midwest to see if Joe Biden can build back that blue wall that Donald Trump tore through uh, four years ago. And of course, we're still watching Texas, which is a toss up still at this hour. Let's go into Texas and see what results we have at, at this hour. So across the state right now, so close, you can see it. Joe Biden up 49.6% to Donald Trump's 49.1%. That's a difference of just about 45,437 votes. But Biden up with 52.5% of the state reporting. Now let's zoom in on a couple counties and see how Biden is, is accomplishing this lead thus far. In counties like Harris here, he's building a significant lead, about 14 percentage points, a difference of about 187,970 votes. Let's compare that difference to what Hillary Clinton did back in 2016 here in Harris County. You can see Hillary Clinton won this county by 161,959 votes. So Joe Biden is outperforming Clinton so far with about 20,000 more votes. Will that be enough to flip a state like Texas? I think he needs a little bit more than that, but we're going to have to keep counting the votes. What's interesting, too, is those counties in the Dallas area that I've been talking to you for the last week that we should watch to see if they were bellwethers that could tell us what Texas might do. Here in Collin County, you can see those margins are pretty narrow. Yes, Joe Biden is losing Collin County in the suburbs with about 70 percent reporting. He's losing it by about 17,500 votes. But let's see by how much uh, Hillary Clinton lost it in 2016. Hillary lost Collin, uh, Collin County by about 60,000 votes. So you can see Joe Biden is outperforming again what Clinton did, although he's still losing Collin County. It's still red in Donald Trump's corner. Same thing we see here in Denton County, a 28,000 vote difference. Back in 2016, it was a 59,000 vote difference. So Democrats are cutting into President Trump's margins in these suburban Dallas counties. And in Tarrant County, right Tarrant County back in 2020, if we flip over here, you can see it's a dead heat in Tarrant County in the Fort Worth area, a difference of just 732 votes, 732 votes separating Trump and Biden. Let's go back to 2016 again to get some perspective. And Donald Trump won that same county four years ago by 57,500 votes. One more quick thing that I do want to mention that is catching my eye is this county right here, north of Austin, Williamson County. It's a Republican stronghold, typically has been for years. But with 70 percent reporting, Joe Biden is ahead narrowly 50 to 47.5, a difference of about 8,213 votes. Let's go back to 2016 and see what happened then. And you can see back then that county was a pretty strong win for Donald Trump. Nine percentage points and 19,700 vote difference. So is Joe Biden doing better? Are Democrats doing better across the state of Texas? Yes, they have a lead if we go back out to totals. Oh, actually, just in the last few minutes, you can see what happened. Donald Trump has taken the lead, I believe, for the first time tonight in the state of Texas by 0.1 percentage points, a difference of 13,543 votes. Will it go back and forth throughout the night? Are there more votes here in Harris County and these metro areas for Joe Biden to boost up the score? We'll find out. And we'll also be watching how the Rio Grande Valley fills out in terms of those Hispanic voters that we've heard the Biden campaign has been struggling with and they've been trying to win back in these closing days of the campaign. Fast, fascinating stuff, Marcelino, but as you said, it's still early. It's only 8.30 right now. We'll be watching that all night long as you look at the election tracker. Fascinating map there, the changing face of Texas, red and blue, and maybe it's going to be purple. We'll be watching it all night long. Thank you so much, Marcelino. And here's some more numbers for you.
And welcome back to our digital coverage on this election night. I'm Rekha Mutaraj along with Ron Trevino. You know that election results, as you can see, have been coming in in the last hour or so. The Associated Press has called a victory for Republican Dan Crenshaw for District 2. Crenshaw re-elected to his second congressional term. He gave a little speech earlier today saying, pray for our president. You don't need to wish me good luck anymore. Jason Miles live at the Houstonian where Crenshaw's team has gathered tonight. Jason, a lot of happy people out there. That's right, they're still arriving here tonight, Rekha. I'm not sure if they expected things to wrap up so soon, but the AP, the Associated Press, called this race pretty early on, shortly after 7 o'clock, uh, declaring victory for Dan Crenshaw. Now he will be entering his uh, second term as a congressman from the District uh, 2 here in uh, Houston that represents, uh, he represents um, several of the suburbs, Kingwood, Spring, over to West Houston, even some neighborhoods in the uh, inner loop including parts of Bel Air, West U, even Montrose and the Heights. Uh, I think we have a live picture from inside the Houstonian, one of the event spaces here where Dan Crenshaw's now victory party is underway. Um, many of his supporters started arriving a little before seven o'clock. Uh, tables spaced uh, apart a good, a good ways, although you can see in the crowd that uh, people are, are mingling uh, fairly closely together. There were several signs up, I can tell you though, that said uh, masks would be mandatory during tonight's event. Now, Dan Crenshaw, the congressman, did come out and speak briefly, as you mentioned, saying you don't have to wish me the best of luck anymore or something to that effect. Basically, this is wrapped up. I think the last totals I saw, he was uh, winning uh, 56 some odd percent to 43 percent. His Democratic challenger, Seema Lajavarian, Lajavardian, I should say, she gave, addressed her uh, supporters via Facebook Live and Zoom just within the last 30 minutes or so, saying she knew this would be an uphill battle, but she is a breast cancer survivor. Battles are nothing new to her. She wished the congressman the best of luck. Uh, let's listen to a little bit of what he had to say a little earlier. Pray for our president, and uh, you don't need to wish me good luck anymore. <laughs> Not even close, not even close. You heard him there say not even close. Congressman Crenshaw with his trademark eye patch, uh, just teasing the crowd a little bit, if you will. Uh, we expect him to come back out and give a more formal acceptance or victory speech at some point this evening. Meantime, many of his supporters here will continue mingling and celebrating what was a pretty rapid victory for him. Guys, back to you. Yeah, absolutely, Jason. You know, Dan Crenshaw had raised more than $16 million for his campaign, so he was clearly well-funded against his opponent, Seema Lejavardian. And then, of course, remember, he had that celebrity status, if you will, after, you know, comedian Pete Davidson had mocked his eye patch. He showed up on SNL, so he definitely had a national presence as well. A lot of people uh, not surprised by his victory tonight. Jason, thank you so much. You know, we have a group of local political activists and commentators who've been talking with Janelle Bluta in a virtual panel. Here are early signs they're watching for as the results come in. I guess that's my question. You know, what are you guys watching out for? Obviously, the key states, we all know those, but like specifically. Well, some of the first local results are in. Oh. And Biden is right now up 56% in Harris County to 43% for Trump. Uh, that's not unexpected. What I'll be interested in is looking at how numbers start showing up in places like Fort Bend County, Tarrant County, Collin County, Denton County, Hayes County, a number of these, Brazoria County, a number of these areas I think are going to be le leading indicators. If Tarrant County repeats what it did in 2018, where Beto O'Rourke for the first time since 1952, a Democrat carried that county outside of LBJ, uh, if that repeats, then that notion of Texas going blue or at least turning purple becomes a more likely reality. And I think even though we don't have much yet in terms of concrete calls on how the votes are going to come out this evening, we also can look to what happened in the 2018 midterm election as perhaps a, a bit of a predictor. I think a lot of folks at home tonight are gonna be very reluctant and apprehensive to assume anything too early because many of us were very surprised 
and certainly the polls were all wrong the last time we had a presidential election, but we can look to the 2018 midterms as an indicator that voters want to see uh, themselves more, more, more diversity, and certainly we're electing more women into office. I think about here in Harris County, 17 black women judges elected, and so perhaps 2018 is a, a, a safer predictor of what we might see playing out tonight. You know, from the, from the league's perspective, although we want to call these things earlier on, the league is concerned that every single vote is counted because you know with the number of mail-in votes, you know with each state managing these ballots differently, we want to be sure that every vote is counted. So we're trying to tell people to be patient, but we'll see how it goes tonight. I think what's really important to talk about in terms of the Texas map and the opportunity that Texas has is that we're sitting here discussing a potential transformation of the state that hasn't happened in over 40 years. That speaks to the momentum on the ground. That speaks to the amount of voter registration that happened over the last 12 months. And it talks about this uh, reoccurring pattern that we have seen now for the last couple of election cycles, where young people, people of color, are driving forward and increasing their share of the electorate and the participation, um, which is really, really important to, to note. Um, to also recognize that this is of historic proportions. What we just saw is Texas um, lead the nation with the largest percentage of early voter turnout in the country. That is absolutely remarkable. It's to be celebrated. And at the end of the night, whether this, uh, regardless of how the election results turn out, Texas won. Democracy in Texas won. It's a more rep representative democracy. It's a more engaged electorate. And you'll see this continue to happen over the next coming years. And hopefully you'll see counties like Harris County continue to lead. Uh, Texas has 38 electoral votes and the power to not just shift the political spectrum in the state, but in the United States altogether. And, you know, a lot of the work that has been done in Texas has been done by nonprofits that have had to really pull teeth to get the attention of the nation to our state and for people from across the country to recognize that Texas is a political powerhouse that is in play. And we've been doing this in one of the most toxic political environments in the nation with every voter suppression and intimidation tactic you can think of thrown at us. But regardless, you're seeing people come out like never before. And in spite of that, you're seeing participation soar. Texas uh, has is uniquely positioned to write the next chapter of American history, and you're seeing it start tonight. I am I am truly inspired. Like Antonio said, like Texas won. No matter how this turns out, Texas won, uh, and and I'm really inspired and encouraged because young voters traditionally and historically do not show up, and we are showing up in the droves. So I'm just I'm inspired. Dan Crenshaw re-elected for a second congressional term back on stage at the Houstonian speaking to supporters. Let's listen in. I see some of them. <laughs> no, I quite literally am. <laughs> we wouldn't be here without all of you because, I mean, you're our support, right? You guys are what drive this dream. You're what light this dream on fire. Fire needs to spread. And that's what happened. We won by like seven points two years ago. Did any, did we win tonight? Yeah. What was the, anybody get a anybody get a good count of that spread? It was pretty good. It was more than seven. More than seven. Quite a bit more than seven. Final counts aren't in. But I'll tell you what, hell of a lot more Republicans voting today than Democrats. So we're looking at plus 12, probably. That's OK. That's OK. I'm pretty happy with that. This is our Independence Day. There's a reason I played that video. One, because it's really cool and really inspiring. But there's a deeper sense to it. There's a deeper sense of meaning to it, which I really love. All right? There's something about saying this is our Independence Day. Every election kind of is, because there's two conflicting visions in America. All right, one that wants to control your life, which believes they are your moral betters, and they want to tell you how you should run your business, where your money should go, because you know they can spend it better than you can. So just give us a little bit more taxes. Let's just tax you as much as possible. Right? They think they can destroy the Texas energy sector. 
They think they can open up our borders. They think they don't have to stand up to China because China rising is better. They think all these things. They think that you shouldn't defend yourself. And if you do, well, they want to tell you how. Right? They want to tell you how many bullets you should have in that magazine, what kind of gun you should use. They want to tell you every little thing about your life. There's this belief on the left that they can change human nature, that, they're, that these elites can change human nature, that they just know better than you do, that self-government is a thing of the past, that the Constitution is outdated. It's this living document, according to them. This belief that that tradition doesn't matter, that institutions of old and wisdom doesn't matter, that knowledge is not passed down generation to generation, that you can decide right now what should be truth. And truth changes, according to the left, on a whim, really. This is a problem, really. If, if you're talking about how to govern a country in a stable way, this is a problem, but this is their vision. This is their vision. That's what's been on the line. I have a different vision. A vision where you can self-govern, where you decide how to sell your time and labor, where you decide what to do with your time and your money. Where your free speech is protected, where your right to worship is protected, where your right to defend yourself is protected. Because there's a thing about Independence Day. We're celebrating the Declaration of Independence. This document that tells us why we govern. The reason government exists. To protect your inalienable rights. Said it right there. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the sole purpose of government. Right? You didn't vote today because you asked something of government. You didn't vote today because you asked government to give you something. Right? I don't think you went to the polls today saying, I hope I get something free for this vote. I, I promised my vote in exchange for something, some kind of transaction. But this is the promise of the left, this bribery. Right? They promise you things. They don't care if they can deliver it. Right? Because this is what they do. They'll name some, some fancy program. They'll add some money behind it. And they'll say, look what we did. Let's give ourselves a little slow clap. Slow clap at each other on the back and say, look, we bribed the voters again. We bribed them. Bribery equals control. Right? And you tell people, we can control you because you're not capable of doing it yourselves. You're helpless. You're a victim. You're oppressed. Whatever it might be. Tell people they're not in control. Tell them they have no agency. Tell them, tell them they're helpless. Tell them that the only, tell them, like Venezuela, tell them the only way they can be helped is if government helps them. So they derive purpose from their vote. They derive purpose from government. They believe government is God. They derive this almost religious acquiescence to government. It's a very strange thing to watch. And, it, and if you listen to their language, the language of the far left, the language of the progressive left, it is religious, right? It's almost like rituals being repeated over and over again. You ever argue with a far leftist? It's like rituals being repeated. It's a very strange thing. It's a very strange thing. It doesn't make any sense. It's not based on any kind of governing principles. It's not based on how we're going to govern. You know, it, it, it's based on false promises. It's based on bribery. This is not sustainable. This is not sustainable. Socialism always comes in the language of compassion. Ask the Venezuelans, ask the Cubans. This is how it comes. This is how you destroy a country. We will not let it happen. And we have a different vision where the purpose of government, according to Western Enlightenment values, according to the American founding is to protect your inalienable rights, to provide you a structure within which to thrive, to provide you a structure within which to pursue your happiness. That's the purpose of government. That's the point of the Constitution. The Constitution tells us how to govern. It's under direct threat. The, the, the left is outwardly Show, outwardly shows animosity towards the Constitution. They want to destroy the Electoral College, add more senators in Washington, D.C., destroy the filibuster, pack the Supreme Court. They want a world 
where 51% of the majority can tell the other 49% what to do. They call this unity, right? They call that democratizing America. When they say our democracy is under threat from Donald Trump, what do they really mean? They mean they don't get to tell the rest of us what to do. That's a really problematic truth. See, when Republicans win, the worst case scenario for America is you just get to do more of what you want to do. Imagine so many people in America being mad at that proposition. They're just mad because they can't control you. The, the, fact that, the, the fact that representatives who represent San Francisco are just mad that they can't make us in Houston live like they do in San Francisco, this is a problematic trend. It's a very un-American trend. It's a trend towards tyranny. Because the left is never, the left is not full of liberals anymore. This is a problem. Liberals are happy to differ with you. The left is not. The left is not happy until you agree with them, until you speak their language, until you recite their rituals, until you agree with them both in thought and both in speech and both in policy. This is a problem. This is tyranny. This has to stop. Everything is on the line in this election. I know, I know, you guys have been in, at this a long time. You're probably used to politicians telling you that. But this is a pretty decisive one. The Democrat Party is not the party of Barack Obama. It's certainly not the party of Bill Clinton. They've changed radically. I mean, geez, under Barack Obama, they were not a party of open borders. They were, they were not a party of where socialism was an accepted terminology. But now they are. Now they are. Now, now they outwardly want to destroy everything about Texas. Everything we hold dear, right? 250,000 jobs supported by the oil and gas sector here in Texas. Or sorry, here in Houston. That's just Houston. Millions in Texas. Proper estimates would assume that there's going to be almost 20 million jobs lost if you just ban fracking in America. Joe Biden says he's going to ban fracking, then he's not going to ban fracking, whatever. You know what they are going to do? They're going to make it impossible for us to permit. They're going to make it impossible for oil and gas to buy insurance. They're going to make it impossible for investors to invest. They're going to make sure that Russians take over the global market for gas. That's their goal, apparently, whether they know it or not. I don't know. And we were listening to Congressman Dan Crenshaw, re-elected to represent District 2, uh, defeating Seema Lajavardian in this race, talking about independence, allowing people to spend money how they want, defend themselves how they want. The 34-year-old former Navy SEAL largely aligning himself with President Trump uh, during his re-election campaign and has been re-elected to a second term. All right, you've probably seen the images of stores and government buildings in cities across the country. They're boarding up, even closing down today and tomorrow because of concerns about potential unrest after the results of this election are known. We asked Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo about this, and here's what he said. All of our sworn members are in uniform, ready to deploy to any threat, and it's really important that uh, Houston Remember, we are Houston. We set the example, the tone for the rest of the country. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, we don't expect any problems here. But if anything uh, breaks out, we're not going to tolerate uh, any kind of criminal conduct on, on, anyone's, uh, on anyone's part uh, as it relates to it reacting to the, the election. Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo talking about Election Day security. All right, let's talk to Bob Stein, now our political analyst. And as we go to you, Bob, uh, we understand that challenger M.J. Hagar has conceded to, gender, uh, to Senator John Cornyn. You're not surprised about that, are you? No, no. I, I, I thought John Cornyn would be probably the big vote getter in Texas on election night. Um, he was running well ahead of anybody else statewide, of course, the president who's, I wouldn't call it a close race, but um, is leading by maybe 2% over 2, 3% over uh, Joe Biden. But um, Senator Cornyn was popular. Um, I, I suspect he got a modest, maybe even small, but 
not trivial a crossover vote. Hager just never got herself um, any traction. I think when uh, Royce West, the man who she beat, Senator West, West from Dallas for the primary um, nomination, failed to endorse her in the in the weeks after the primary, that sent the wrong kind of signal and raised some concerns, particularly with African American voters and her commitment to um, Black Lives Matter. So uh, they cleared that up, and I think he became a, a heart uh, felt supporter, but it just didn't give her any traction. And Cornyn was never um, quite the candidate that a Donald Trump is to Democrats. Um, and in fact, I think in the last couple of maybe month to six weeks, he's really made an effort to distance himself from the president, making remarks like, you know, he wished the president didn't say the things he did. And he tried to convince him to be more careful about the COVID um, response to COVID-19. So I think Cornyn's a um, not a surprise by any means, and uh, probably um, represents really what I think is, you know, if, if in fact the Republicans hold on to the Senate, the president wins tonight, um, I think John Cornyn is going to find himself in a little bit more influential position. I think um, Mitch McConnell, who is, of course, re-elected tonight also pretty handsomely, might see his uh, age um, become a factor in continuing to be the, the, the leader of the party. I think he might actually look to John Cornyn for a little bit more help and I'm not saying they'll fight over it, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Cornyn be more influential should there be a Trump second administration with a majority Senate. Um, I think they'll want to do some things and particularly on health care. John Cornyn's a guy that I think can put together the coalition if the Supreme Court overturns ACA, so uh, Obamacare. So okay. again, I'm thinking forward, this election isn't over and by no means, but no, Cornyn was not a surprise and I think we all felt that he would run way ahead of the president, way ahead, four or five points. Okay, well, let's talk about something else we just heard. We heard from the uh, Houston police chief, Art Acevedo, talking about security and safety on election day. And we have seen in other cities, but not here in Houston, uh, some businesses boarding up, uh, uh, just uh, the fear about what could happen on election day or the election, or the days after the election. Uh, but how do you think things went today? It seemed like everything went pretty peacefully nationwide. I think nationwide it was, it was uh, maybe it was a good thing that everybody voted early and by mail. Um, they wouldn't congregate on election day as passions might grow. We, we at, at, at the Gray Community Center, which is one of the most popular voting places, which barely had anybody voting there today, there was an altercation. Uh, Trump supporters were allegedly blocking the way of some voters and making a lot of noise, but I don't think they came to any real physical blows. Um, and we hope, of course, whatever the outcome, this election um, will not result in the kinds of things we often see in third world countries. Um, Absolutely. The yes. simple fact of the matter is that businesses, I know the White House is boarding up. I know that there are um, cities, um, mainly you know, places that have already seen from Black Lives Matter some demonstrations about you know um, George Floyd's death and others in Kenosha, but we can only hope um, that whatever the outcome, it'll be accepted by the American public and, and done peacefully. And yes. that's about the best we can hope for. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about uh, any kind of trends that you've seen. It's been about an hour since I talked to you last. Have you seen anything that surprises you uh, with the numbers as they trickle in? Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised um, at Ohio. Um, the numbers there, it w I was looking also at where the vote is coming in. Um, the president should have considered Ohio. I know some people called it a toss up um, and he's leading there, oh, I would say, not handsomely, but he's got about a three or four, three, two or three point lead. I'm just surprised that that was not a state that didn't flip. Uh, I noticed also from the exit polls, something that I had not seen before and was mentioning this, the book lab, that what you're seeing is um, demographic groups in different states behaving very differently. There's much to be written about women and particularly women with college and non-college educations and that that would be the latter of the college educated white women would be leaving Trump in North Carolina. That's simply not the case. It's a razor thin um, big, uh, margin there for for Biden. But white women who had voted for Trump in 2016 are staying with them. The exact opposite in Ohio. So oftentimes demographics, even within a region, say pretty stable. And I think what you're seeing here is um, the effect of um, possibly campaigning and the conditions that exist in Ohio versus the conditions that exist in a state like North Carolina. 
particularly in terms of economic situation. Um, it may very well be that the economy becomes more of an issue through COVID in Ohio than it did in, in North Carolina. The outbreaks and the failure of the economy to recover. But right now, I think the president has got a slim lead in Ohio by about 51-48, oh, which is a good three-point lead. Um, but that's with about, what, 75% oh, of the vote. North Carolina, it's, it's, it's a dead heat. I mean, these guys have, I think, about a 3,000 vote uh, difference um, with about, um, what, share of the vote in? Almost, uh, yeah, almost 90%. That one's going to be a very close race. What about Pennsylvania? Um, Pennsylvania, we just don't know. It's a little bit early here. Um, Trump's leading there by a healthy, well, we only have about a quarter of the vote there. And President Trump is leading by what I would call maybe a, a, a percent. Now it looks like 2%. Mm -hmm. um, if Pennsylvania falls to Trump, I really think it's going to be difficult to for Biden. Um, he's going to have to sweep Wisconsin, Michigan, and then pick up Ohio, North Carolina, and or Arizona. Um, Pennsylvania seems to be, again, as I said, more of the keystone here. And, uh, the and, early may returns, and, and, uh, and maybe we won't know tonight. We may not find out tonight. Yeah, I think, you know, again, the mail ballots are being counted and have been since the morning. Um, I think Biden expected, again, it's, it's early and we have no idea where those votes are coming in from. Um, at this point, I think you're seeing um, the Philadelphia, Chester County area, Allegheny, the big urban areas are coming in. But what you don't see are the counties in the far southwest part of Pennsylvania, where I think uh, Trump has a strong support. That's also fracking country where um, oil and gas become really important. And okay. that was a good issue. For well, let's come, back, let's come back to the Houston area. Uh, which of the races are you watching right now? We know that some have been decided already, but there's, uh, there's so many that still haven't. Well, we don't know much about, I mean, we, we, it'll be a while before we get the election day voted. And as I said before, that's where I expected to see a big push from Republicans who had not yet voted. Um, if I had to pick a race to watch, I'd say Sarah Davis, 134th against Ann Johnson. Um, Ann Johnson had about a six to close to 7,000 vote lead over um, incumbent Sarah Davis, just with the early vote. Um, now the question is, we've had about 200,000 votes in Harris County on election day. The 134th could be maybe five, maybe even 10,000 votes, maybe more, maybe 20. Um, hard to tell in that area because I haven't really looked at the district. But again, six, 7,000 votes is not an insurmountable lead going into election day. So I wouldn't you know, make a premature judgment here, but I think when you're trailing by that much, you really, it's gonna be a hard pull for her to pull up that vote, particularly if you don't really think there were that many Republicans in that district who hadn't yet voted and that there were any, and there were no Democrats that would vote on election day. I think at that point, the edge is, is, is to um, uh, Ann Johnson and winning that seat. But again, a little bit too early to call. Um, the one that surprised me was uh, Kulkarni. I could be wrong here, but I looked at Brazoria, Fort Bend, and small parts of Harris County. And um, Nels has what I would call a, 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 a substantial lead. He was running up 5,000 vote majority or plur, uh, uh, margin in Brazoria, about the same, almost seven in uh, Fort Bend. Harris is a very small portion of the district, but he was also leading there. Um, again, that's only with the early vote, but again, I was assuming that the election they vote in Fort Bend would continue to be more heavily Republican. Mm, I think he's closer to winning than, let's say, a Sarah Davis here in Harris County. Um, other race, I think we mentioned before, Michael Moore against uh, Ram Mr. Ramsey. Um, that's for the commissioner seat number three, the Steve Raddick seat. And again, um, Moore trailed in the early vote by about five to, I think it was close to 6,000 votes. That's a lot of votes to try to make up on election day. When again, in that district, the propensity um, was for Republicans to vote on election day. And it was, it was nominally a Republican district moving um, towards Clinton and of course people like Fletcher. But I think again, when you're running that far behind with early vote being almost what, 80% of the vote gas, just simply not enough votes to uh, pick up. All right, well, it's 11 after nine on election night, so the night is still young, Bob. We'll check back with you in just a few minutes. Rekha.
uh, back to Election Central at NRG Arena. Adam Bennett has been there all day. Uh, you know, Adam, we heard from Chris Hollins, the Harris County clerk a short time ago, calling this election a success, especially with the help of those newer voting methods like drive through voting and 24 hour voting. And then before that, we saw those first boxes of ballots show up. So it's certainly a long night ahead counting all those votes, Adam. It is, but Rika, Chris Holland said he's pretty confident that they should be able to count most of, if not all of these votes by midnight. He says that's because most of the votes in this election, 1.7 million total cast, more or less, and more than 1.4 million of those were cast during early voting. About 200,000, a little more than 200,000 were cast today on election day across those 800 plus voting centers. So they released those early voting results along with uh, some, some of the mail-in ballots that had already come in. Those results at seven tonight, just after seven. So we already had a pretty good idea of where these races stand. Most of those results have been released already. But as of about an hour ago, all the polls had closed that were open today. Those first results started coming in. The election judges have been dropping them off at these drive through lanes just outside. Uh, they've then been wheeling them in here. We've seen some of that equipment go by. And uh, like I said, Chris Hollins is pretty confident that they will continue to count these as the night goes on, as they receive them, and that they should have a firm idea of what the results are, uh, minus some outstanding mail-in ballots come early in the morning tomorrow, maybe even by midnight. So Chris Hollins did speak a short time ago. I want to go ahead and play uh, some of what he had to say. Today, 1,250 voters cast their ballots at the Toyota Center drive through location. And that's in addition to the 127,000 who voted using drive through voting during the early voting period. We received a total of 179,000 mail ballots. We had 45,000 voters who originally applied to vote by mail, but ultimately decided to cast their votes in person. And there are still 25,000 mail ballots out there. We will continue to await those mail ballots through 5 p.m. tomorrow, and we will count all of those that were postmarked by today at 7 p.m. Yeah, so there you have it. They are still waiting for some of those uh, ballots that were mailed to come in by later tomorrow afternoon. But for the most part, they will have just about all of the votes counted. Uh, they hope by the end of today, all in all, the total, a little more than 1.7 million votes cast across Harris County, that beat the total from 2016. And it also translated to about 67% turnout, which County Judge Lena Hidalgo said is the highest it has been since 1992. Wow. Send it back to you. That is incredible voter turnout. And results by midnight would make a lot of voters very happy. Adam, thank you for that reassuring news. OK, let's go to Marcelino Benito now. He's following the electoral map and election results as those numbers come in, looking at potential shifts in the balance of power in the Senate. And Marcelino, you're breaking it down for us with an interactive map. What's the latest? Well, Rika, let's look at the latest in the race in the Texas Senate for the Senate seat here in Texas. We know MJ Hagar has conceded to Senator John Cornyn. Cornyn has won re-election. He won this time by around so far uh, nine percentage points, a difference of about 732,000 votes. I want to show you last time he ran how much he won by, 1.2 million votes. Of course, we're still counting votes. I don't think he'll get to that vote differential. So you can see Democrats again closed in, but Hager not enough to win that Senate seat. That takes us to the balance of power here in the U.S. Senate. We haven't really touched on this tonight. This is really what's at stake for Democrats. Democrats are pretty confident they're going to keep the House. They're hopeful they can take back the U.S. Senate. So this is where things stand right now. Republicans had to defend 23 seats tonight. So far, they are at 41. Democrats had to defend far fewer seats, about 12 seats. They are also at 41. So we're, we're tied up right now. But keep this in mind. 41 Democratic Senate senators, two independents that caucus with Democrats. So really, for all practical purposes, there's 43 Democrats in the Senate right now. The magic number for Democrats to take back the Senate is a gain of three. Right now, we have a gain of one. So somehow they need to come over here and win at least two more of these Republican held seats. If they're able to do that, they get to a combined and if they're able to do that and keep those blue seats that they that they're defending, they get to 48 Democratic seats plus two independent senators that gets them to 50. 
50 would be enough to take control of the U.S. Senate if and only if Joe Biden wins the presidency. If Joe Biden can't win the White House, then Democrats, if they want control of the Senate, they're going to need a net gain of four seats and, of course, hold on to the ones that they're defending. That would get them to 49 Democratic seats plus the two independents that caucus with them. That gets them to 51. So four seats they need to gain if Joe Biden does not win the presidency. Speaking of how Joe Biden is doing in Texas, let's check out the results here in the state. You can see Trump up. Uh, he, Trump was down most of the night, but every last hour he's taken over the race. He's up by about two or three percentage points, a difference of about 270,000 votes. Biden's still doing well in the metro areas like Harris County, Dallas County, here in Travis County, Bear County as well. But I want to show you a trouble spot for, for Biden. We saw Kamala Harris in town the Friday before the election day trying to gin up Hispanic voters in the Rio Grande Valley. I want to show you this county right here, Hidalgo County. Of course, we're only 71% reporting right now, but keep this in mind. Joe Biden is winning by about 19 percentage points, a difference of about 35,560 votes. Watch what Hillary Clinton did in 2016 in that same county. Let's click right here. There you go. What, look at that difference. That same county, Hidalgo County, right on the Rio Grande, Hillary Clinton won that county by about 40 percentage points, 70,000 votes. Again, we're still 70 percent counting right now in 2020, but Joe Biden is only winning that same county by 19 percentage points. That could show a potential weakness that Joe Biden had with Hispanic voters, something his campaign was worried about. They were trying to shore that up in Texas and in other states like Florida uh, leading up to Election Day. But so far, uh, he's underperforming among Hispanics, especially if you compare what Hillary Clinton was able to do. That won't be enough to flip Texas and turn it blue when you have those types of numbers among Hispanic voters who are a huge chunk of Texas's voting population. But we'll keep counting the numbers and keep you updated throughout the night. All back right, you. Marcelino, you're following several races here, you know, back to those Senate races. And more than a third of those 100 Senate seats uh, are on the ballot and Republicans defending many of those seats in this election, Ron. Interesting to look at the trends and what's happening so far. And right now, let's look a look at, uh, let's take some, uh, some more results in right now. Well, it's been an election, well, it's been election, 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 and let's bring in Vlad Davidyuk, our yeah, GOP our strategist, strategist who we've been talking with tonight. Talking. And Vlad, since we talked to you last, uh, Crenshaw and Cornyn 
uh, wins for both of those candidates. Uh, you're not surprised. You're not surprised by either one of those, are you? No, those are two strong wins that uh, were obviously in the making. Uh, they were certainly targeted by Democrats. M.J. Hager and Simula Javardian um, brought in tons of resources and some heavy, some heavy guns from the Dem from the Democrat Party, but they weren't able to prevail because both of those candidates, Cornyn and Crenshaw, have worked really hard to build up that grassroots on the ground support, boots on the ground. Uh, across not only Congressional District 2, District 2, but some of those larger um, areas that have historically supported GOP candidates in the Senate. Um, I'm, su I'm not surprised by either one of them winning. Um, uh, it, it was a waste of money on the Democrats to focus on those races. Um, I'm really surprised. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, in, in Fort Bend County, Troy Niels has actually pulled ahead of, of Cole Carney. I mean, results are still uh, early, obviously, but he's done... Fantastic work in getting those numbers way up. Um, as Bob was mentioning earlier, that the, the numbers are looking very positive in both uh, Fort Bend and Harris County. Um, and that's another key race that Democrats are targeting very early. Okay, and let everybody know again that you are a Republican strategist, which is why you're happy about the results right now in that race. Uh, let's, let's talk about how the presidential race is is playing out right now in Texas. Again, it's still very early, but but what do you see in terms of trends? Well, uh, President Trump's numbers are down from 2016, and those margins are going to be a lot smaller. But he's still continuing to bring in the 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 margin that he needs to prevail. Um, it's a bit worrisome that some of those margins have shrunk so significantly compared to 2016. Again, a lot of those results are still very early in the process, so we may not get the full picture um, and we may not be seeing all the information at this at this early stage, but the, the margins are still a little bit smaller than what they what they were four years ago. And, and that shows that the investment of time and resources that Democrats have done in some of those key areas has started to pay off in terms of blunting uh, President Trump's advantage. Um, certainly, uh, this cycle, uh, President Trump was able to focus more on some other states that were uh, would be more helpful down the road in terms of his in terms of his race, and so he didn't spend as much time in Texas, uh, and and that has shown up in in some of these uh, gains that that Democrats have made. I still look at the returns that we're seeing now, and I still see a strong win for President Trump in Texas. It may not be. Um, a very a very sizable margin, but it's still going to be there. Okay, can you talk about what you're seeing uh, in other parts of the country in the presidential race? Let's talk about some of the swing states. Maybe it's too early to talk about Pennsylvania, but what, what about some of the other states? Well, look, I mean, we're, we're seeing we're seeing some incredible numbers um, fluctuating um, in in some of these key states. Early on in the evening, we saw uh, states like Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, really trending towards Biden, North Carolina, but since since the polls have closed, we've started seeing those seeing those states swing dramatically towards President Trump. Um, and he's built up some pretty significant advantages in Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, North Carolina, and and those leads appear to be durable at this point. Um, you're you're seeing in those same states um, that the Candidates who are lower on the ballot are all, are all starting to do well as as well, and that's indicative of those numbers firming up. Um, we're we're seeing um, even even numbers like in in Wisconsin, uh, he's he's doing well. So uh, it's still early in the evening. Obviously, some of these results are still um, developing as we as we see numbers as we see ballots coming in and we see returns being counted, but. The fact that he's leading this early in the in the evening is indicative of a very strong performance um, and it, a really good testament as to his uh, traveling to those states during these last couple of weeks of the campaign and holding rallies and meeting people on the ground and getting that vote out. Do you think it's possible for some of these uh, states for the pendulum to go the other way as it has, uh, you know, earlier this evening? Possible. Um, I mean, there's um, like right now, Wisconsin. We've only got 33 percent of the vote in, so there's still a lot of vote to be counted, and so there's always a possibility. Pennsylvania has 30 percent of the vote counted, and we've got Trump at 30, at 53 percent. There's still room there um, for things to change. Pennsylvania officials actually just announced that they won't be counting 
uh, many more ballots this evening to give a uh, chance for ballots uh, returns to come in. So we may not know the results there for a while. Um, in Michigan, Trump is leading. Uh, it's only 33% of the vote has been counted. So it's still very early, but those leads are very promising with re with regard to his campaign and his candidacy in each of those swing states. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, it should, do you think maybe we won't know till maybe tomorrow? Very likely that we won't know some of these states until tomorrow. Probably Pennsylvania is probably going to be the biggest one. Uh, reports look like they're saying uh, we may not know full results until at least 5 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, Pennsylvania time, which would be about 4 a.m. here. So uh, it's very possible we may not know uh, who won Pennsylvania until tomorrow morning. But being a Republican strategist yourself, you're saying that tonight Republicans are feeling really good about the president's chances. Right now, yes, absolutely. I think I think that the the needle has begun to swing back towards President Trump uh, uh, doing much better uh, tonight than what a lot of prognosticators had had predicted uh, as as late as uh, yesterday. Um, I think his his outstanding performance in Florida it was a very strong start to the evening, and his. Uh, performance so far this evening in North Carolina and Pennsylvania have done a lot to really help Republicans feel a lot stronger. And then in South Carolina, you saw Senator Lindsey Graham has just been uh, uh, called it as the winner. And that was a very highly contested race where his opponent spent $100 million and came up short. Same thing in Kentucky, where Senate, uh, Republican leader Mitch McConnell's opponent spent $100 million as well, and she fell short. So we're seeing a lot of these key races in different states where there was a huge focus and a huge amount of energy, time, and resources dedicated to defeat these key Republicans fall short. And we're seeing that translate into some of these swing states as well, and that bodes well for Republicans across the map. Okay, so we've talked about the swing states and, and the votes that are going on right now that are making Republicans happy. What about the ones that are making Republicans worried right now in terms of swing states? Uh, I, I think right now uh, there, there's some concern with uh, North Carolina. It's still a little bit close in terms of Senator Tom Tillis. Um, he looks like he might be able to pull it out, but right now it's still a little bit closer than what we would would have liked to see. Um, and Ohio seems to be a little bit closer than we would like to see as well. Bob was mentioning that earlier, that there's a lot of key areas of, of Ohio where uh, the margins have shrunk quite a bit. And so those are those are worrisome, too. Has the evening gone as you expected it, or have you seen a lot of surprises? You know, uh, I have not seen a huge amount of surprises. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised by what uh, Sheriff Nails has done so far in CD22. His, his, his numbers are starting to look a lot better. And North Carolina, uh, I, I guess I'm not surprised by where, he's, where President Trump is at North Carolina. I'm surprised that it took this long to get there. I would have expected that number to materialize a little bit earlier in the evening. And hopefully, uh, we, we all knew that Pennsylvania was going to be not only the keystone, as Bob said earlier, uh, to this to this election this year, but uh, it's it's a little disappointing that they were not able to get uh, a little bit firmer grip on their election vote counting process to get those votes counted in. Other than that, this evening this evening's going pretty well. All right, from your view, from your viewpoint, Vlad. Davidyuk, GOP strategist, thanks for talking for uh, talking to us tonight. I'm sure we're not done talking. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs> Reka. All right, you know, election results are pouring into our newsroom. Some known victories so far. Congresswomen Sheila Jackson Lee, Sylvia Garcia, along with Congressman Al Green, Dan Crenshaw, all winning re-elections. Also, Senator John Cornyn claiming a victory as well. But let's take a look at some of the other election results that are coming in now.
Welcome back, everybody. I'm Ron Trevino along with Ray Kamutaraj as we give you our extensive election coverage. Did you go out and vote today? We certainly hope you did vote this election. Uh, one thing that we're watching is the Electoral College, which is very important, obviously, for the presidential race. Uh, Marcelino Benito is in front of our election tracker looking at all the numbers and all the trends, Marcelino. Well, Ron, we know the magic number for both men tonight is 270 electoral votes. You don't win the White House without hitting 270. So here's where the race stands right now on our electoral map. Biden is at 131. Trump is at 108. Again, throughout the whole night, no real surprises. Everything that was solidly blue is blue tonight. Everything that was solidly red in Trump's corner has stayed red. No surprises to tell you about. In fact, all the battlegrounds were still counting, and a lot of those races are very, very close. I want to show you the state of a lot of those races that we've been watching closely here on AP on our AP site that keeps that keeps track of county by county in some of these battleground states. You see anything just like our map that's dark red has gone to Trump. Anything that's dark blue has gone to Biden. But then you see the slightly shaded red and lightly shaded blue. Right now on this map, you see a whole lot more lightly shaded red. And that's because right now Trump is ahead in a lot of these battleground states. Let's pop into Michigan real quick. Let's go back to the presidents. We're in the we're in the Senate right now. So let's go back here. There you go. Let's pop into Wisconsin to start off. You can see Donald Trump is ahead by about three percentage points. It's close. It's a toss up state. It's one of those states Biden needs to win if he wants to build back that blue wall. Let's pop into Michigan. It's leaning red right now. Donald Trump is up by about 12 percentage points. Not what the Biden campaign wants to be looking at tonight as those votes are counted. Ohio is leaning red as well. All important Pennsylvania. It's hard to imagine how either one of these men wins the White House without Pennsylvania. And you can see right now Donald Trump is up by about eight percentage points on Joe Biden. It's a lot of the same trend that we're seeing across the country right now. Florida is leaning towards Trump right now. More votes. He's ahead in North Carolina. He's ahead right now in Georgia. He's ahead right now in Texas. Biden doing well in Minnesota. He won that state. Uh, Hillary Clinton won that state, I should say, uh, four years ago. Iowa is right now leaning towards Biden. He has a slim lead. And all important Arizona right now is trending towards Biden as polls just closed there not too long ago. And we're starting to count those votes. Bottom line, if you're a Republican, a Trump supporter, tonight you're feeling good with the numbers you're seeing so far. Of course, we haven't called any of these races. We're still counting votes. But right now, Donald Trump, I told you early on, earlier in the night, I've been telling you for about a week and a half, Donald Trump had a narrow path to 270. He had to, had a perf he had to have a perfect night. Right now, he's on his way to having one of those. But again, a lot of counting still happen here in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. We may not have answers about what's happening in these three pivotal states until maybe tomorrow or a few days from now. So patience will be key. Back All right. You. Thank you so much, Marcelino Benito. We knew it was going to be a long night and it's going to maybe take a few days. Thank you so much. Reka. All right. Thank you so much, Ron. You know, it wouldn't be election night here at KHOU without our political analyst, Bob Stein, who has been with us all night. Uh, Bob, I want to start with talking about convenience when it comes to voting. You know, we heard from Chris Hollins, the Harris County clerk, saying, look, when you give people access, they are more likely to vote. So let's start with mail-in ballots. How popular were they in this election? Well, they were clearly much more popular than they'd ever been before. Um, but we didn't see, obviously, the kind of explosion you'd see in states like Pennsylvania that went to no excuse mail-in voting. We're probably close to a plurality of votes, if not a majority will be cast by mail, in part because of COVID-19. Um, we limited, of course, after the battle with the um, Attorney General to just people over 65, others disabled, but COVID didn't count for that. I think there'll be a greater demand for that type of convenience. Even if the Republicans retain control of the legislature, there'll be discussions of whether or not we should extend uh, mail-in voting as a no excuse mail-in voting. And I think the counties um, will be clamoring for more freedom to um, open up uh, in-person early voting. It'll be interesting. The Republicans, um, like the governor for COVID-19 was willing to do it, but he might not be willing to support it as a general practice in uh, non-pandemic um, uh, era. But I think, the, as I said before, there's a taste here and it's not just limited to Democratic voters. I think you found that it was extremely popular across the board, particularly the in-person early voting, the use of a large number of locations. We should be very careful here. As good a job as Chris Hollins and his colleagues have done, it could, could not have been done without commissioner's court expenditure of close to $21 million, some of which, of course, came from federal relief money. 
mm -hmm. due to the COVID. Not clear that the state is going to put that kind of money up, nor will the, the, the town, the taxpayers be willing to spend that kind of money on elections when may be threatened with uh, more flooding and the need to uh, protect uh, infrastructure. That said, I think the voters have a taste for this and they'll want to see it continued. And mostly this will be a county by county. So I think in the, in the big metroplexes like Houston and Dallas and Tarrant and Bear and Travis County, you'll see these types of convenience voting. And they probably have a dramatic effect on increasing voter turnout. Um, whether you buy the anecdotes or not, um, this type of convenience makes it more likely that people will vote. Um, but it's very much a political issue. I mean, it's like wearing masks in, in the pandemic. Um, Democrats see this as a as a privilege, uh, excuse me, as a right. Um, Republicans see it as a privilege and are more concerned that if you open and make voting easier for people, you open it up to a voter fraud. Democrats see fraud as not existent and surely not worth worrying about against the risk of suppressing and denying somebody a vote. Um, it's very much um, a partisan question that I think is going to continue um, with or without a Trump victory. I, as I said, I don't think Trump is the, the motivator for this kind of debate. This is a level of polarization in the American electorate that's been there for and growing for the last 20, 25 years and not likely to go away. I think tonight's election shows us uh, both here in Texas, uh, a narrowing of the gap maybe between Democrat and Republican base voters, but we are as close as we were in 2016. And again, we don't know much of what's going to happen tonight, but my sense is this election is closer than um, even the polls would have suggested, and many of them showed it was closing at the end. But these election reforms, I would expect particularly the vote by mail and the expanded use of in-person early voting um, are things that will become much more popular and demanded by voters. Yeah, the pandemic certainly dictating a lot of the convenience voting, as you said, sounds like some of those new ways will stick around in future elections. You know, Chris Hollins also said that we could have our votes counted in Harris County by midnight. Is that because early voting was so popular, breaking records this year? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, in a lot of ways, it was, it's just like how you fight the virus. You spread it out. You, t you pull it down. If you can extend, as the governor did, another week of early voting, then you can spread the vote out over as many as, as we did, 16 days plus election day. Um, there was lots of mail-in voting. And all this does is it makes it a lot easier, not only for voters, but for poll workers and poll officials. Poll workers don't find themselves overwhelmed at any given day, at any given location, at any given hour, which means they can give more attention to helping voters who've not navigated voting machines are not familiar with the identification that's required. And it also allows you to process the ballots. Not only are the mail ballots opened and certified well before election day, but the early vote is collected, tabulated, and of course the court secured um, for that release. So that the only vote you have to report and collect and tabulate is on election day. And as you see, we had 200,000 votes. We had more votes you know, counted in the uh, cast in the mayor's race in 219. Um, of course, 800 locations, the uh, poll judges at these locations literally have to drive to NRG or to some of the remote locations to um, deposit their um, vote totals, but they're usually done on, you know, essentially disk drives. Um, and that's just a matter of computer. So, yeah, I think 10 o'clock, the only thing that slows things down is traffic. Um, <laughs> and we're a big county and low density. But um, this is the kind of election, I think, Democrats, Republicans, and even Klingons would like to see. This is not an election in which anyone can complain about how it was run. There are people like Mr. Hotze and Mr. Toth who don't like drive through, but trust me, people like drive through. It's here to stay. Uh, I'll tell you an anecdote. We had surveyed for the previous county clerk, um, Diane Troutman, and we put the question in the survey at the beginning of the uh, COVID um, uh, uh, pandemic. And she, she was like, are you crazy, Bob? Why did you ask that question? We can't do drive through voting. And I say, well, you know, there are other jurisdictions that have been doing it, smaller, yes, but people really liked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, they piloted during the primary at only one location along the 610 loop near HTC. And as, of course, we all now know, I think it was 126,000 votes. People like it. I call it Sonic Burgers with a ballot. You know, <laughs> we don't like to get out of our cars to get McDonald's or Sonic. I want to be clear here Sonic, McDonald's, everybody. Why would we do? I mean, we care more about our burgers probably than do what we do about some of our votes. But again, the consumer in this case is your voter and yeah. they demand it. So 
Um, and as I said, there were more Democrats probably that voted, um, at least by my count, but enough Republicans that um, even they, like I think Vlad said, you know, someday there'll be Republicans who are under under 70 voting and they will want to drive up, and even the 70-year-olds. But I think, um, don't kid yourself, the battle over how we vote and where we mm -hmm. vote and when we vote will continue. Um, I know the president will um, probably tonight look very happily on some of the election results, but we still got a lot of states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and he's concerned about those mail-in ballots, and mm -hmm. he'll probably make some more um, uh, tweets about that as the, as the evening gets further along. Yeah, I, you know, back to the drive-through voting. I, convenience is certainly there, um, but I know a lot of, um, especially parents, you know, pile the kids in the car, and, and this was their only chance to vote. And considering um, the situation that we're in health-wise and COVID-19 concerns, um, it was certainly beneficial uh, for more reasons than one. But I want to ask now, um, changing gears about the type of voters that are coming out this year, uh, specifically the minority vote, and locally, what is issues mobilized greater numbers it? of uh, black and Hispanic community members to vote in this election? I, I think one only has to pick up um, a newspaper or, or, a, or a, get a, a Twitter feed. Uh, black Lives Matter is to say nothing about what the president has done, I think, to um, unavoidably, if, if, if avoidably, um, Claim those types of racial passions, remarks about people in Charlottesville being good people or making other remarks about people coming across from Mexico. The president has not helped himself in this case. And I think what he's done is more, I, I, I'd, I'd actually argue that he has been as much a mobilizer of new and younger voters than has um, the Democratic Party or Joe Biden. They've taken advantage of it. But the president was, I think, in some ways vulnerable to himself, you know, fanning the flames of these types of conflicts, and not just on race and ethnicity, but on gender, um, on national origin. Um, he tends to find um, some flaw in somebody and exploit it, whether they be disabled or not of, of, of the quite aesthetic pleasing nature that he thinks women should have. It's just he's always had um, a, a difficulty sort of being what I will call a little bit more neutral about some uh, voters and, and, and bypassing them. Plus, I think the other is you've got a generation of voters, younger voters, who are coming of age in an economy, in a society that, although has been done very well for many older people, has not done well for them. I mean, the proportion of kids who have with college degrees still living at home, who don't have health care, are saddled with enormous debt, um, educational debt, and um, show little prospects of being themselves able to form families, buy homes. And, and live as we would call the American dream. I mean, the president talks about this enormous and expansive economy, and it is, no question, an expansive economy, um, mm -hmm. even for those at the lower levels. But when you look at young people, mm -hmm. not necessarily people of color, but just young people, um, what I notice, I've only spent 40 years teaching in a university, but I've never seen that kind of discontent, that sense of, you know, the future just doesn't hold very much for me. Um, that's not what um, the American dream is about. Ironically, the president looks at an economy that's been enormously effective and has trickled down. Black unemployment is the lowest it's been since the end of the Second World War. And yet, President Trump has made, and I think we'll find at the end of this election, mm -hmm. enormous inroads with black voters, and particularly Hispanics. But what I notice is he's making those inroads with mostly larger, popu older populations. Um, particularly among blacks and particularly among Hispanics. So when you look at people under 45 or even 35 and the 18 to 25 year olds, um, that's what I think Vlad talks about is the future concerns of Republican. If you're, if you're going to win in 2024 and 2028, you're looking at a different demographic and a different mm -hmm. electorate. And the partisan preference of those young men and women and their attitudes towards each party is being formed now. Um, Bob, and sorry. Again, they're not a big portion of the electorate, but they're big. They're, they're growing. You know, Bob, you mentioned, and, and really quickly, you talked about disappointment. No matter how the vote swings, no matter who wins this election, half of the country will be disappointed. That is a lot of people. Do you remember an election where such a large population has taken a re election results so personally? Because this election is very personal to so many Americans. Yeah, um, I wasn't around for it, but I think the 1860 election um, led to, to, to some tremendous disappointment. I was only uh, 22 in 1970, 
uh, excuse me, 1968, I was 18. I wasn't able to vote. The uh, 26th Amendment hadn't yet been, had not been ratified. Um, that was the election in which, uh, of course, Hubert Humphrey lost to Richard Nixon. The country was terribly split. We had gone through um, a summer of rioting, not, I mean, I, I would say at least equal and probably exceeds what we saw this summer um, with uh, George Floyd's deaths and the shootings in other communities. So this country is not immune to these kinds of splits. Um, and I think what's happened here is the demography is such that the population at one end of the age continuum, maybe thanks to Obamacare, is living a little bit longer and voting a little bit more frequently. Um, but you're seeing that transition. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think there are periods, the McCarthy period of the 1950s uh, may not have had the kind of violence that we've seen recently or had during the 1960s and 60 um, anti-war movement, mm -hmm. but this country's been terribly split. And I remind people about the beginning of the Second World War, but for the Japanese attacking us at Pearl Harbor, it's not obvious that we would have entered the Second World War. The Lend-Lease and FDR's interests may have, you know, there were plenty of Americans who would hold um, the American-German Bund rallies in Madison Square Garden supporting the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler. So. These are the kinds of things we forget about in history, but this country has been badly split before and has seen some level of violence. We forget about the, the yeah. bombings of the weathermen in the, in, in the, in the 1960s. So we I are suspect worried tonight we'll yeah. see that kind of split. I see no evidence yet of any outpouring um, in the streets, mm -hmm. and I hope it doesn't happen. Yeah, no matter what, tomorrow we all take a deep breath. We realize life goes on and that we're in this together. Bob, thank you so much. We'll catch up with you in a little bit. Ron? Political analysis and a little history lesson too. <laughs> Our group of local political activists and commentators have been speaking virtually with our Janelle Bluda. Here's what they had to say about what has motivated so many Houstonians to get out and vote. But people have a substantive reason to vote because they do see that their vote matters now more than ever before. And I know a lot of you have done outreach down on the local level. What are some of the things you're hearing people tell you about why they're registering or even these new voters that you're seeing? Why this year? Why is it now? You know, Jolt invested very heavily in young Latino voters, folks 18 to 32 year olds um, that are driving forward this change. And in our studies, we identified that the key voting motivators for them are number one, health care. COVID has decimated communities of color, disproportionately targeted Latino and Black communities. And we're seeing young Latinos uh, witness their grandparents, their mothers, their fathers die because of the lack of access to affordable health care and, and, and because of the incompetence of this current administration. And so they're turning out to vote like never before. Number two, immigration reform. There's still 545 children who have been separated from their parents who have not been reunited. Uh, this fight is near and dear to our hearts and it's happening in our backyards here at the Texas border. Young Latinos recognize that and are standing up to, define, to defend and fight on behalf of their families. And lastly, racial equity. Latinos understand that the police uh, injustice, the social injustice and unrest we've seen in this country affects us equally. We wanna make sure that we're standing, uh, standing side by side with our uh, black brothers and sisters and fighting this head on. Yeah, and for and the youth who often may have taken for granted government or not realized what government will do for them, both at the federal level and especially in local government, whether we're thinking about the crisis brought on by COVID-19 or the social unrest that's been taken literally into the streets in protests, suddenly now we understand, and the youth especially, I think, understand how important it is to vote for representatives who not only reflect their values and the future that they want, but who can make a difference in what's happening literally right outside the door on the street today. People just feel passionate. And so when the League of Women Voters has been out uh, registering voters at universities and at restaurants, because we couldn't do the big naturalization ceremonies this year, thanks to, to, unfortunately to COVID, I mean, there were lines of people just saying, I want to vote, I want to vote. People have become more activated, more sensitive, more tuned in. So whether you like it or not, the pervasive tweets or the constant nightly barrage of news about one thing or another happening, it's caused people to really be more introspective and tune into how the, their government affects them. And I think that's in part what's driven more people to pay attention, including young people, a lot of historically 
uh, unempowered communities, a lot of folks who, again, as I described earlier, just hadn't felt compelled to vote because depending on where they live, they didn't feel like their vote made a difference. I think to really sum it up, I, I know for young folks, uh, people are galvanized because the current administration or the people that I'm talking to, they feel is an existential threat to them. Um, for so long, people had not felt as though their vote mattered. And there was a bit of a status quo and a slow progression to more inclusivity uh, and more equity across all communities. And then within three to four years, people really are starting to view that uh, as a threat of no longer happening. Um, whether you're talking about uh, immigration and our DACA brothers and sisters, whether you're talking about social justice, uh, whether you're talking about women's rights, uh, people are viewing this uh, current state of play is a, uh, as an attack on their personhood. And so people are more engaged in the political process at this moment. All right, we're running out of time, but let's talk to Vlad Davidyuk. He's the GOP strategist. Vlad, earlier in the evening, you said that uh, Republicans are feeling pretty good about tonight. Is the president feeling pretty good about tonight so far? Absolutely, I mean, I mean so far, I, I think you're looking at the map um, things are looking extremely promising for for the president and Republican candidates across the, across the map. Um, we we lost uh, Senator Gardner in Colorado, but um, we we pit, we've gotten Senator Lindsey Graham in South Carolina. He's uh, President Trump is ahead in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Obviously, all those states are still very early, but he's ahead, and uh, he actually even pulled out uh, Rhode Island just now. So things are looking promising across the map for Republicans and for President Trump. We may not know who uh, will win the White House until maybe tomorrow at the earliest. Very possible. Uh, I mean, a lot of networks are still not calling uh, Florida, even though 99% uh, of the votes are in and, and President Trump is ahead by almost 400,000 votes. So there's still a lot of questions out there. We still may not know a lot of these results until very early tomorrow morning, especially in a state like Pennsylvania. But if a lot of these other states start coming in sooner, it may make that unnecessary. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, the, the work is still going to be continuing in each of those states as those votes get counted. We're out of time. You've had the last word. Vlad Davidyuk, GOP strategist, I'm sure we'll be talking in the coming days. That's going to wrap it up for us tonight. But be sure to watch us on KHOU 11 News at 10, Reka. Absolutely. On behalf of Ron Trevino and I, thanks for watching the KHOU 11 election web coverage. You can text the word results to 713-526-1111 to get results from the races. And our live election team coverage continues in one minute with Len and Mia on KHOU 11 and KHOU.com. Good night. numbers. Texas, once considered a Republican stronghold, inching closer to a toss-up state. More people than ever using mail-in ballots and drive through voting. The polls have closed and voters get the last word. We're covering it all from Texas to Washington. KHOU 11 News at 10 starts right now. The contentious campaigning, non-stop political ads, and different viewpoints over how to handle the pandemic have led to this night election night and we're covering all the races for you from your local representatives to the biggest one of them all the race for the white house so let's get right to the latest numbers of how the candidates are doing in texas and this of course the numbers we have in right now with 72 percent of precincts reporting president trump leading in texas with 51 percent of the vote Joe Biden with 47% as well. And tonight, President Trump and about 400 guests are watching the returns come in at the White House. Earlier, the president made a rare visit at his campaign headquarters in Virginia, where he hinted at possible legal action if ballots are still being counted in the days ahead. A lot of shenanigans, a lot of bad things happen with ballots when you say, oh, let's devote days and days, and all of a sudden the ballot count changes. Winning is easy. Losing is never easy. Not for me, it's not. Joe Biden is watching the returns at his campaign headquarters in Wilmington, Delaware. Earlier today, the former vice president visited five battleground states, including Pennsylvania, where he criticized the president for wanting to stop counting votes after tonight. President's 
got a lot of things back with him. One, one of which is he thinks that he can decide who gets to vote. Well, guess what? The people are going to decide who gets to be president. We have live team coverage for you tonight as we watch the results continue to pour in. Let's begin with Marcelino Benito, the KHU 11 election tracker with the latest on turnout. Marcelino. Well, and I want to give you a quick look at the electoral map first. As it stands right now, we have Joe Biden at 135 votes right now. Donald Trump, we have him at 108. No real surprises on the board yet. All these toss-up states incredibly close. The counting still going on as we speak including right here in Texas. So let's pop in and see how things are going in Texas in the presidential race. We are at 77% reporting, and you can see Donald Trump is winning by about four percentage points. I want to take you back to 2016. He won the state four years ago by nine percentage points. Turnout then was about 8.9 million. We've already surpassed that in 2020. So turnout is higher, especially in Democratic areas across the state. We're talking about Harris County. Look at that vote total. 1.4 million votes cast in the presidential race so far in 2020. Back in 2016, four years ago, turnout for the presidential race was 1.2 million. So we're already seeing big increases. The question is, will it be enough? At this point, it doesn't look like it will be in these major metropolitan areas. One big area I'm watching that may indicate what may happen with Texas tonight or why it may not flip blue as many Democrats were hoping and dreaming about is this county right here. This is Hidalgo County right along the Rio Grande Valley. You can see Joe Biden is winning by about 19 percentage points. Hillary Clinton won this same county four years ago by 40 percentage points. That could explain trends we're seeing across the state of Texas tonight. The good news for regardless of your party is turnout is definitely up across the state. When? All right, Marcelina, I'll pick it up from here. You'll notice we have all the results scrolling at the bottom of your screen. We also have crews covering some of the biggest local races. That includes Congressional District 2. Republican Dan Crenshaw fought to keep his seat against challenger Seema Lajavardian. And as you can see from these results, he won. Jason Miles is at Crenshaw's watch party at the Houstonian tonight. Jason. That's right, Mia. This party got started early. The uh, AP calling this race shortly after 7 o'clock. Let's take you inside an event room here at the Houstonian. Former Navy SEAL and incumbent Congressman Dan Crenshaw had a much tougher fight two years ago, you may recall, but sailed to a second term this evening. He made a few brief comments uh, soon after those results came in, then came back later to thank everyone for tonight's much healthier margin of victory, along with touching on platform points like the economy, keeping energy jobs in the Houston area, and public safety. Take a listen. We wouldn't be here without all of you because, I mean, you're our support, right? You guys are what drive this dream. You're what light this dream on fire. Congressman Crenshaw addressing the crowd for quite some time. Many uh, folks now leaving, but they certainly had a good time tonight. Meantime, Democratic challenger Seema Lajavardian spent the final hours of Election Day campaigning. She addressed supporters tonight virtually and wished Crenshaw well, although she thinks he should address some things she brought up during the campaign. She said she knew it would, it would be an uphill battle going against Crenshaw. Of course, uh, many see him as a rising Republican star. But for now, he will assume a second term representing Congressional District 2. Guys, back All right, to you. Jason, thank you. Now let's check out the congressional race in District 7. Democratic incumbent Lizzie Fletcher being challenged by Republican Wesley Hunt. These two, by the way, graduated from the same high school. Here's a look at the early results in that race. Still waiting on the results there to get a look. But Chris Costa is at the Kirby Ice House where Hunt is holding his watch party. Chris? Well, what we know right now, according to the Secretary of State's website, is that Lizzie Fletcher's leading in this race by about 51% to 47% for Republican challenger Wesley Hunt. Uh, still no update from the campaigns. We've been in touch with their spokespeople to see when they might be delivering some remarks. We're expecting Lizzie Fletcher to deliver hers via Facebook Live to her supporters and then a Zoom media availability afterward. Uh, Wesley Hunt uh, is supposed to 
speak to supporters here at the uh, Kirby Ice House Memorial location. Uh, some of his supporters who are here at the party waiting for him uh, are cheering in their support as they hear other results uh, for uh, states coming in favor of uh, President Trump. So no update here from the campaigns yet. Uh, but what we do know is that according to those latest totals that appear to only include those early voting numbers is that right now, it stands 51% for Lizzie Fletcher and 47% for Wesley Hunt. As soon as we get an update, we'll let you guys know. All right, sounds like a plan. Chris Costa, thank you. Another congressional race we are watching closely is District 22. That's in Fort Bend County. Sheriff Troy Nails is hoping to trade his badge for a seat in Congress. But Democrat Shree Preston Kulkarni is also fighting for that seat. Let's take a look at how that race is shaping up so far. We're going to work to get those numbers for you just as soon as possible. We're just hearing folks. In the meantime, Grace White joins us live in Sugar Land with the very latest. Grace. Mia, Nels is ahead by several points according to the early vote totals, but keep in mind several precincts are still counting their ballots tonight. We want to take you to Nels's watch party in Richmond where a few hundred people are gathered for an outdoor rally. Nels is yet to arrive, but his campaign told us earlier today that they believe he is the most well-known and trusted candidate on the ballot. Remember, he's the current sheriff in Fort Bend County, and the Nels camp believes that gives them an advantage. As for Shri Preston Kulkarni, we saw him earlier today at Smart Financial Center just before the polls closed. Tonight, he will be addressing his supporters virtually. Remember, he narrowly lost to Republican Pete Olson last time around, and now that Olson is retiring, Kulkarni is back. He told us tonight he believes he has the momentum in voter turnout to flip this district. Back out here live to Today in Fort Bend County, voter turnout was big, 75% according to the county judge, which means more people than ever before weighing in on this race. Lynn and Mia, back to you. All right, Grace, thank you. Let's check out the U.S. Senate race. John Cornyn, the state senior senator who has held that seat for 18 years, wins again. Late tonight, Hagar called Cornyn and conceded. Matt Doherty joins us live with more on the Cornyn victory tonight. Matt? Lynn, this was one of the earliest races called tonight. Senator John Cornyn accepted his speech, his, uh, accepted his win via virtual speech earlier. Cornyn says his bipartisan work has helped him make progress in the Senate, and he's seen as a moderate by many conservatives. Recently, Cornyn shared the distance between his views on certain policies as opposed to the president's. Cornyn beat Democratic challenger M.J. Hagar 53 to 45 percent. In a tweet, Hagar wrote her expectations were shattered and that her grassroots effort is far from finished. Back to you. All right, Matt, thank you. A reminder, the latest results are scrolling at the bottom of your screen throughout the show. Also, simply text the word results to that number, 713-526-1111. We'll send you a link on election results right to your phone. While we might have unofficial, while we do have unofficial results tonight, counties still have to report official numbers to the state. And with so many mail-in ballots, that could take a while. We're at Election Central in Harris County to find out how long that's expected to take and how many ballots they're still waiting on to come back. And the balance of power in our state legislature had the Democrats managed to take control of the House. We're taking a look at the numbers. Nothing to worry about weather-wise. What a gorgeous Wednesday it's going to be. 50 in the morning, 77 in the afternoon. We'll look ahead to the weekend forecast and our next chance for rain after the break. Houston, you are a valuable member of the...